Good morning and welcome to the Environment Committee meeting today. The main item on the agenda is a discussion on energy efficiency with our guests. However, we just have a few short items of business first. Please may I remind everyone to switch phones to silent mode and ask that members and guests ensure that electronic devices are not placed in front of their microphones. Can I now ask our clerk if any apologies have been received? Apologies have been received from Assembly Member Gibbon. Thank you very much, Anna. Section 2, Declarations of Interest. Can I ask the committee to note the recommendations set out at item 2 and ask if members have any other interest to declare? Noted. Thank you very much. Section 3, Minutes. Can we confirm the minutes of the Environment Committee meeting held on 26th of May 2022 to be signed by me as a correct record? Thank you. A summary list of actions. Can I ask the committee to note the ongoing and complete actions arising from previous meetings? Thank you very much. We can now move on to our main item of business, the discussion with our invited guests on energy efficiency. I would like to welcome our guests here in the chamber and joining us remotely. Uh, can I begin with Catherine Barber, who is the Assistant Director, Environment and Energy of the Greater London Authority, Chetan Ladd, who is Interim Head of Energy from the GLA, Councillor Rowena Champion from Transport and Environment Committee of the London Councils, and Nadia Smith, Project Manager, South East London Community Energy. Also joined in the chamber by James Wilson from Islington Council. And joining us remotely is Cara Holmes, who is the Senior Policy Advisor from Citizens Advice. Uh, welcome to all the guests and also to those Assembly members also joining us remotely. Um, I'll begin our questions and if I can start with uh, Councillor Champion. Uh, this section is on energy efficiency and the cost of living crisis. So just to open that, us up, I'd just like to ask, how is the ongoing cost of the energy crisis and also the cost of living crisis more generally affected demand for energy efficiency advice and support in London? So I think we go back a little bit further with COVID. So this service, we run a um, called Shine, which is an advisory service for um, people who are suffering from pure poverty, but within um, so on lower lower incomes and, and also people with lots of long-term disabilities and health issues. And so through that, we get a fairly good idea of what is concerning people. Um, so it started off from, and we've been doing that for a long time, and it's, an acro it's across London, um, and partly and significantly funded by the GLA to do that. Um, so we found out through COVID there was an increase in demand on the service anyway. Um, but also, on top of that now, comes through. So, so when you know, people started talking about energy prices going up, there was real concern about people, so they started calling, um, getting in touch about almost their fear of energy um, bills going up. Um, and now the stream that's coming through is also people who are actually experiencing very high energy bills. And, and that has a considerable, um, there has been a considerable increase in, in the amount of people that are coming, that are coming through. Um, and, but at the same time, unfortunately, there is a corresponding reduction in support that was otherwise available from, for example, trust funds and for other grants, um, I th we think probably depleted during COVID. And obviously now there's a considerable demand on it. Um, so, I, so I think demand in, in quarter one of 2022, when um, people were starting to be concerned about energy prices, was 116% up on uh, quarter one of 2021. Um, which in itself had, had seen an increase compared to um, 2020. Um, and that obviously, it, it puts quite a lot of um, demand on the service, but it absolutely showing um, the need for the service, but also the concerns of people coming through. And we could provide probably more figures for you if you wished us to do that, um, to show the gradual take up of, um, of the service. And it also, it also does do, just, just, just to say, it also does do some small, um, retrofitting or some um, energy efficiency work and obviously there is demand for that too. Thank you very much and if I could ask you to write to the committee with those figures that'd be really appreciated. Thank you very much for that. Um, Catherine if I can turn to you now first of all welcome back to the committee. Um, can I ask you what has been the GLA's experience of demand for mayoral support on energy efficiency or prices over the last six months? Thank you. Um, well, first of all, just to start by saying um, what a, you know, a terrible situation it is that Londoners are facing, in some cases, choices between heating their properties and eating. Um, this is a really unprecedented situation that we find ourselves in, uh, and it's something that the energy team uh, with, within the GLA, uh, also working with the communities uh, teams, are, are thinking very hard about. Um, and how we can uh, potentially extend our services. Um, but as the councillor has said, we've had strong demand for the Warmer Homes Advice Service 
Um, that's provided by three boroughs, uh, but London-wide, so Islington is one of them, also Kensington and Chelsea and Lewisham. Um, we know that we've supported 15,000 Londoners, um, either with advice or energy-saving measures since 2018. Um, but as we heard, uh, you know, that the demand for that is only going to go up. Um, we have also energy efficiency programs um, which are supporting uh, both uh, social housing providers and residents, uh, domestic um, properties, owner occupiers, privately rented. That's our Warmer Homes program, uh, where we've just opened Warmer Homes 3 to applications, and uh, we're, we're getting take up of that now. We'd like to see more. Um, we, you know, we're pretty sure that due to the high fuel prices. Uh, unfortunately, there will be considerable take up of that because it will be so needed. Um, we also have energy efficiency um, technical support for uh, public sector organisations uh, and we work with businesses through the Business Climate Challenge to, to give them advice on how they can decarbonise and be more energy efficient. Thank you. And can I also ask you, and, and Chetan also feel free to come in here uh, afterwards, if is the GLA satisfied with the government's low income, low energy efficiency definition of fuel poverty? So it, it was changed um, f for a reason, but I think what we're seeing now is that it's very insensitive to energy prices. Um, so the, I think the reason it changed to low income, low energy efficiency was to make sure that the monitoring of government programs on energy efficiency measures uh, really focused on where properties improving. Um, so that made some sense at the time. Um, but now what we see is, although prices have, have gone up uh, exponentially, the number of people who are considered to be in fuel poverty has not changed much. Uh, and that's because the, the building fabric itself hasn't changed. But obviously, people are under a great deal of strain. Um, as we look back at the previous definition that existed, um, we would understand that about a 1% increase in fuel bills would tip an extra 6,000 London households into fuel poverty. Um, and that would mean that we'd gone from about 400,000 London households in fuel poverty in 2020. Uh, that's about 11% of, of London households. It might be over 20% now with the price rises that we've seen. Um, and if the cap rises in October, as forecasters are predicting, um, that could even be over 30% of London households in fuel poverty, according to the old definition. Um, so whichever way it's defined, it's clear that Londoners are under enormous pressure. Absolutely. Um, Chesson, I don't know if you wanted to come in there. Um, I don't really have much more to add to that. Fair enough. Catherine's covered everything. Always appreciate conciseness on the committee. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So, um, Catherine, can I ask you, ask, ask you, how does the GLA use this government's definition to determine eligibility for mayoral support programmes? Um, so the, the key programme we have, Warmer Homes, um, is based on both um, low income and energy inefficient homes. So, Chet, I'm not sure that we actually use the low income, low energy efficiency definition of fuel poverty um, for, for that eligibility. I think I'd need to check that unless you know. So we, we've got two streams of funding for Warmer Homes, three. One is uh, from, from GLA funds, another is from, from where we've um, um, got base funding. So the base funding comes with quite, um, uh, quite uh, sort of detailed eligibility requirements. So I can, I can um, sort of come back with what, what those are exactly, but that, you know, we, we're looking for uh, generally people in the lowest energy efficiency homes and on certain benefits. So it's in some ways, whilst a lot of people are suffering from fuel poverty, um, to be eligible for some of these schemes, um, it, it can be hard to find and target the right people. So mm -hmm. that's what we're looking to work with, um, with, with boroughs across London to, um, to find the right people and get into their homes and cut their energy bills this, this winter. Makes sense, thank you. Um, uh, uh, Rowena, if I can turn to you as well for a London Council's view on this as well. I think it's more an Islington Council of, of view, I think, on, on, on this at the moment. Um, so I think our concern is that it, 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 it's, again, it's about reaching the right people again. Um, so some people fall within a fairly obvious category, but there are many people actually in, in, in Islington and London who don't. Um, so, for example, um, you know, there is the, the data efficiency um, is really, really poor. So people are making assumptions based on, on sort of felonious um, information, really. Um, and, and if you haven't had an EPC carried out on your property, then the estimated efficiency band can be substantially different from sort of the actual energy performance of the property. So that, that's, that's a, a real issue. 
um, but also it's quite it's quite narrow because it doesn't really take into it takes again about assumptions. So someone who is an abandee property, for example, who is fit and healthy, will not have the same be facing the same situation as somebody, for, ex for example, who's an abandee C, but whose whose personal health situation requires um, more heating. So that the, the circumstances of people are not being taken into account. I think we also have slightly concerned that the assumptions are made on the basis you've got a gas heating. So the electric heating, so if obviously if you're, you're using electric heating, we know at the moment that's so much high, higher than, than gas heating, and we don't think that's being taken into account at the moment. Um, but I think, I think it's really that, and also, you know, we know in, in Islington and, and, and across London, you have people who purchased properties when they're quite low in price, who, ho who have very high value properties, um, but who have very, very low, who have low incomes, and their ability to warm those houses um, are, 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 is, is very, very challenging. So I think, I think, going back to the point that was made, actually trying to identify who people are that actually need the help is pretty complicated. And we may be missing not just a few people, but quite significant categories of people. That's really worrying. Um, can I just ask you for clarity if London Council do have a view on this, on the government's definition? I th my problem is I thought we were invited here actually as Islington, so I've misunderstood the basis on which we were invited, I'm afraid. Okay, understood. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand over to Assemblymember Cooper, who's joining us remotely. Assemblymember Cooper. I'm um, going to unmute myself, but I'm actually not going to put on my video because I'm not feeling very well today because I've got a really terrible toothache. Um, so uh, one side of my face is really swollen and I'm just really not feeling great. But I'm just going to dig into some of what you were just saying, both Catherine and also Rowena, if that's OK. Catherine, you were talking about the latest available statistics and the number of London households in fuel poverty. Could you just unpack that for is that after the price cap rises in April that have just come through? And then you're talking about the increase to a possible 30% of Londoners after the next anticipated increases in October. Can I just um, definitely nail that down? Yes, thank you. And I'm sorry to hear you're not feeling well. Um, so the, the methodology is based on using the previous definition of fuel poverty, so not the government's current one, but the low income, high costs version. Um, under that, uh, there were 404,000 fuel poor households in 2020. Um, that was just over 11% of London households. And using methodology from the End Fuel Poverty Coalition, um, that indicates that extra, an extra 1% increase in fuel bills is about 6,000 Londoners that enter into fuel poverty. Um, that would mean that right now, there were slightly over 20%, about 21% of London households in fuel poverty. Um, and then if the cap should rise in October, um, as predicted by reputable forecasters, um, then that percentage could go over 30%, um, and that's even after the £400 help that the government has promised. Um, of, of course, uh, you know, that is not the current definition of fuel poverty, but it does give some sense of how much pressure London is under. And just to return to the point that Rowena was making, um, we obviously have a cohort of people in London who um, are asset rich but cash poor, particularly um, pensioners who might own their own properties and have done so for a long time. So maybe have never had an EPC done on their property because it hasn't been bought or sold or rented out for some years. Um, and, and obviously pensions are not, have not been keeping um, pace with rises in energy bills any more than any other income has been keeping pace. Do you think there's a particular cohort there that might be under-recognised in owner-occupied properties? Sorry, uh, I wasn't trying to think Can we just ask, ask who the question's aimed at, Assembly Member Cooper? Oh, sorry. So that was to start with Catherine and then Rowena. I'm Thanks. sorry. Uh, could, you, could you just repeat that last part of the question, please? Yeah, so it's to do with people who've lived for a long time in properties mm. that maybe never have had 
and EPC Dunham, um, do we know how many of those properties there are and therefore how many of those people who will often be pensioners because they've paid off their mortgage and they're just living where they're living and they haven't moved house, are we underestimating the numbers who could potentially be living um, in a difficult situation and unable to meet their fuel bills because they're in these owner occupied properties where their incomes are very fixed? Yeah. Um, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that uh, based on the, that sort of 400,000 um, uh, figure that I cited from uh, 2020. Uh, I, I don't know um, what the assumptions were that went into that for the EPCs and when they were done or if, if they'd ever been done. Um, I guess, you know, one of the things that we see in London is that we have a fairly large private rented sector. That's unusual compared to other cities or other parts of the UK on average. Um, and that's the tenure that sees the highest levels of fuel poverty in the statistics. Uh, and, you know, for understandable reasons, landlords haven't had um, a, an obligation until recently um, to, to have those sort of decent um, minimum energy efficiency standards. And those are being tightened up, but we would like government to, to tighten them uh, further and faster uh, because that will make a real difference. But I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that, that question on pensioners. OK, though, no, I was going to come on to um, that and to try and dig into some of the Trust for London research that we've been looking at. Um, Rowena, you commented on that. Do you think there's a, an, a possible understatement in the owner occupied sector? Obviously, in the private rental sector, people tend to have had the EPCs done because they're renting out the properties that so they've had to. But where people aren't moving in or out of owner occupied properties that they might have been living in for 20, 30, 40 years. Do you think there's a possible understatement in that cohort? Yes, we do. Right. And is that common across the whole of London, would you say? I think, well, I was discussing it with um, with officers, I think we think probably it's more likely to be in inner London. But again, that's something I think, is, it, as I say, I think it's really worth, we do really need to try and understand what's happening across the whole of London. And that may just be an assumption um, based on our own experience of the type of property that we have in, in those inner, in, inner London boroughs. OK, so that brings me on to some research from the Trust, of Lon Trust for London that we were, we've been looking at, which was published in April of this year. And in that, it shows that the outer London boroughs have significantly lower average EPC, Energy Performance Certificate, ratings. Um, do, I, I think that might be slightly misleading because of the issue of... Um, the, the averaging that is used so obviously where you've had more new builds which is that probably tended to be more in the inner london boroughs um so that sort of drags the overall average up plus you've also got the banding and the issue that you referred to rowena which is the individual in the house obviously their own specific needs will make a difference um do you think that is the case do you really think there is much less um fuel poverty, if you like, in the inner London boroughs than there is in the outer London boroughs? Is that possible? Um, so again, it would be, you know, we should go away and look at that Trust for London report that you mentioned. I mean, a couple of factors which do affect the energy efficiency rating of buildings um, is obviously the age. London has got a relatively old housing stock, tends to be less energy efficient um, and more costly to improve as well. So about 60% of London homes have solid walls, um, which is, again, more than the national average. Um, and we also have half of England's conservation areas, and that has created challenges for retrofitting. Um, and that extra cost of then retrofitting buildings in London has meant we haven't seen as much of the eco-funding that other regions have. Um, and that is one of the mayor's asks that we could then uh, see a fair share devolved to London of the, the eco-budget. Um, because al although it is um, potentially more expensive to, to retrofit buildings in London, it would make a big difference to our residents. So, Catherine, what share of the eco-budget have we had and what share of the eco-budget should we have had based on the number of properties that uh, need this work doing to them? So I think if we'd had the same formula um, for devolution that Scotland has had, I believe we have received about three times more than we have over recent years. OK, so what additional support is the GLA providing to improve energy efficiency to households in the outer London boroughs? You mentioned three inner London boroughs earlier on, but what about outer London boroughs? Sure. So um, the warmer homes uh, 
programme, which is £43 million this year for retrofit, uh, and that is for owner-occupiers and private renters predominantly, um, and gives help for uh, insulating walls, lofts, uh, floors, draft proofing, putting solar panels up, etc. Um, so that targets low income uh, and energy inefficient homes. Um, that, that's our flagship scheme that's open at the moment. Very grateful for your help in, uh, in advertising that for us. Um, and that does include outer London boroughs as well. Um, I think it's, uh, Chet, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's about 17 or 18 boroughs who've come in in the consortium for that. Um, a few others have chosen to go uh, with an Ealing led consortium. Um, so uh, we, we are marketing out uh, to all of those boroughs. Um, and the Warmer Homes Advice Service, again, uh, applies London-wide. Um, it's run by the three boroughs that I mentioned, but it's available to any Londoner to call into. And so, Rowena, um, I was just talking about um, owner-occupied owner sector. What about the private rented sector? Is that the sector and also the type of tenure where Londoners now from all walks of life live in the um, private rental sector. Um, do you think they are affected disproportionately by the cost of living crisis? So sometimes they'll also have very high rent as well as living in leaky private sector properties. I think, I think that yes, very high rents in 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 London are having a real impact on on people's ability to to um, to lead a sort of comfortable life. I, th I think cost of living crisis is hitting. Uh, you know, very many sectors of of, um, um, of London, um, and I think it's difficult. Yeah, absolutely, there are pressures there, but equally, if you're a pensioner living in a very big home that's, that's very expensive for you to rent, you know, there are there are um, to, to heat. There are so many different pressures, but I think we yeah, obviously I think we do think that um, private rented sector is is suffering quite considerably. Um, it is one. It is the highest, as I understand, the category that has the highest level of fuel poverty among among them. Um, but just to go back, can I just go back to the point? Some, so, uh, inner London has, an, has a proportion of flats which have natural ins insulation. So, you know, you, London's a little bit, it's a bit more mixed than, um, than inner and outer. It is, it is the mixture of, of tenure. And as I say, within inner, inner London, you get quite a lot of facts. Equally, you've got, you know, a high concentration of, of um, properties that were, were, are in conservation areas, have solid walls as well. So, it's, it's, as I say, it's a very nuanced picture. And I, just, I think we don't really have that understanding at the moment that, we're, that, that actually we think we need to do, need to. But yes, I do think private, the private rented sector tenants are, are undergoing real pressure at the moment. Marina, also, do you think... Can I just say it's also more difficult, of course, for them to do anything about it? Yeah, sure. They've got to rely on their landlords to step up and do things. Rowena, can I just ask you, do you think improving the energy efficiency of London's homes should be seen as a short, medium or long term goal in addressing the current cost of living crisis? It's quite a difficult thing, isn't it? I probably see them in terms of all three of those. So I think in, I think there are some short term measures that can that can be taken. And I, so I, I think the, the, the prioritisation of of, um, of doing it is it must be the short must be a short term goal you know we must basically there doesn't seem to be the urgency behind the situation that we need and we really we really need to be doing that you know not just not not just in terms of net zero carbon i mean number of boroughs have 2030 targets but we have a longer term net zero carbon um that's absolutely key we need to get on with that but actually in terms of helping people to live to live a reasonable life at the moment um working out how you quickly intervene into some of these really difficult to heat homes, support people who absolutely need it, who may be suffering from real health conditions. Um, you may be old, just can't move around. Um, you know, that's a really short term measure. And I think doing sort of more investigations into, into actually who we need to be targeting money and then targeting, finding money to target at that, at that I think is really, is really a really short term, probably going to be short term to medium in reality but i think it's at the, and then how you actually then retrofit whole for, whole ho homes i don't necessarily think we're really there in the short term yet i don't think we have that understanding to say that this is what we can do and we can just continue to roll it out let alone having the finance and obviously the skills that the workforce needs to have thank you thank you chair i'm going to stop there i think i'm straying into um the next set of questions sorry thank you i'm going to go to some member Bokhari in a second but chetan did you want to come in there I was just going to say on the on the short term, medium term, long term point. Um, I think initially we might have all thought that high energy prices might have been for just a year or a year and a half, 
that it's looking like they could they could stay high for, for you know a good couple of years now and just doing retrofit as soon as possible will to as many homes as possible will just will help with that cost of living challenge for more people as well thank you um uh, sorry nadia <laughs> Yeah, just to add, um, I agree with a lot of the points that have been made, um, although there seems to be an issue around um, finding uh, the need or the, the people that are really requiring these services. And I think that um, it's quite surprising for me to hear that um, uh, we seem to be not aware of where the need is because having worked in a community energy enterprise, we're very aware of where the need is. And I think um, the more that we can utilize community energy groups to identify where that need is, um, it, it would you know, severely uh, make our path to actually getting the right support out there a lot quicker. Um, community energy enterprises, we are, we've seen a huge growth in the amount of people that are contacting us during and post COVID for energy advice services. Um, and on your question about has the you know interest in energy efficiency increased, it's increased not just in homes and, and in the domestic sector, it's also increased quite a bit in community buildings. We know that there is an energy price cap for the domestic um, tariffs, but there's no energy price cap for business tariffs and community buildings like Schools, community centres are also facing a kind of a cost of living crisis and they are the centres that are providing a lot of support for these vulnerable people and, and helping them access the right services. So we really need to think about those as well. Um, small businesses, again, are seeing the same issues. A lot of our small businesses are also the people that are falling into fuel poverty. Um, we used to see that it was just, um, or, or it was mainly focused around, you know, pensioners and, and people who were, uh, not working for various reasons that were in fuel poverty. Now we're actually seeing a huge number of people where um, it's families that both parents are working full time and they're still struggling to make ends meet and, and choosing between heating and eating. I think your point's very well made and I believe it's a good segue where Assemblymember Bokhari wanted to go next. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think some of the questions were covered earlier by uh, Assemblymember Cooper about uh, the, uh, the impact that there are Londoners who are living in both energy inefficient homes as well as being impacted disproportionately by the cost of living crisis. And I think Councillor Champion said quite clearly there's not enough data. It's very difficult for you to kind of really get a clear picture on this. Um, and if you want to add anything more, anything more on that, please do. But uh, Nadi, you, you also talked about schools just now as well and businesses that are being impacted. Um, uh, is, you know, there, is there any immediate acute financial pressures right now uh, facing Londoners by that, that increasing home energy and efficiency? Uh, how can they be achieved? What, what, can, what more can we do short term? So over the past three weeks, I've um, been out at school sites and community buildings, visiting them to see if we can put more efficient LED lighting in those schools. And I remember one school I visited, I think it was um, four days ago, and the business manager there was saying that she was forecasting over a 100% increase in the school's energy bills um, within the next few months. Now, I must have heard this from pretty much every school and every community building that I have been to. And the school is really concerned about how they are actually going to fund their energy bills, never mind you know, funding the increase in costs of um, supporting their, their families to access the right support. Um, places like these, over COVID, she was telling me that uh, they had been working very closely with the local food bank, they'd been working to um, make sure that all of the families that could access free school meals were accessing them and, and similar. So have schools been approaching local councils for support? Have you, have you looked into that at all? Yes, um, it, there's a varying support out there for community buildings um, and, and especially small businesses. One of the brilliant things that we have in Lewisham, uh, which we highly commend the council for, for implementing, is the Lewisham Community Energy Fund that funded energy efficiency measures in a few schools that we worked on last year. Um, another big support mechanism is the London Community Energy Fund, which is um, 
pretty much the only fund out there for, for community-focused energy efficiency work at the minute. Um, as the Urban Community Energy Fund was scrapped years ago and, and the Rural Community Energy Fund just closed and ended for good a few weeks ago. Um, so, yeah, that's the main support mechanism out there for community buildings at the minute in terms of energy efficiency that we've been using. And uh, it's, it's been brilliant, to, to say the least. So, d I mean, uh, at the moment, we, we're seeing that London is actually probably the worst region in the country in terms of uh, electricity generation from solar panels uh, and solar power. Do you think that we could be doing more here um, in solving the fuel poverty situation in London? Um, you know, to what extent do you think uh, we could address this pressure? But on terms of how we can use solar energy more, is that something that you've been working on too? Yeah, so um, in terms of solar energy, we work in two uh, sort of avenues. The first avenue is supporting community buildings to get solar power. Um, so we finance and manage the solar so that the you know panels don't break down, it keeps working, and the site lowers their energy bills and buys electricity from us as a community group. Um, we also advise homeowners and landlords on solar power and getting solar. Uh, one of the brilliant schemes out there at the minute is uh, a solar, solar Together scheme, uh, which the mayor has implemented. Um, that's been really positive in actually raising awareness amongst the domestic sector around the technology and building confidence and enabling people to find the contractors who can put solar panels on their homes. Having said that, solar is not always the answer. Um, it's always, we have this saying, um, energy saved is uh, the best kind of carbon emissions that you can reduce. Um, so making the property more energy efficient as a starting point and uh, fabric efficient, uh, so taking what we would call a fabric first approach is um, the more long-term solution. But solar is definitely a very good solution for certain properties. Um, there are lots of caveats as to where solar works and where it doesn't work. Um, to bring down the costs uh, pretty quickly and, and the carbon emissions, of course, pretty quickly as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Assembly Member Best. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, morning, everyone. Uh, how, Catherine, um, how many GLA funded homes constructed in the past six years will need to be retrofitted in the future? Sorry, can I just encourage you to pop your mic on? <laughs> Thank you. uh, yeah, we don't have that. I don't have that. To the, um, that here, we can come back to you, to you with that. Um, yeah, please, if you could come back to uh, us, me, me, and perhaps the committee with that information. Um, and how? What are you doing to make sure that no homes being developed in the future will need to be retrofitted? So the, the London plan um, does set standards uh, which go beyond national building regulations. Uh, we require homes built in London to be th at least 35% uh, more energy efficient than um, the national requirements. And although the UK government has tightened that up uh, for the country as a whole, we've then moved so we continue to stay ahead. Um, and that means that the energy performance of buildings here in London um, uh, and the ones especially that the mayor sees uh, is significantly better than they, they have to be um, sort of countrywide. Uh, in the recent energy um, policy guidance that we published earlier this month, uh, we also really put an emphasis on uh, making sure that every possible low carbon uh, avenue had been explored, so connecting to district heating networks, uh, installing solar, uh, thinking about those alternative sources as well as the um, the better fabric of the building too. Thanks. So can I just ask, does that mean, confirm that no GLA or TFL development will go forward and need to be retrofitted? Um, I think that would be quite a bold statement for me to make because uh, essentially you'd have to be at actual net zero on site for there to be no further scope for improvement. Um, and I'm sure that technologies are constantly improving and things like ventilation and, and so forth, you know, that what is good now may be superseded in future. So I, I don't think I can okay, say so that. Okay, so maybe I'll, if I phrase it a slightly different yeah. way then. So would every, every, can you confirm that every GLA or TFL development will be fitted mm. to the standards as they stand today? Uh, they should be. 
uh, and we will come back to you uh, on you know we'll, we'll, we'll look into that I'm sorry I don't I'm not personally responsible for those developments and I'll check uh, what the situation is I th yeah I think we should be slightly more assured that we can meet our own standards if we're asking other developers in London to do so and as you say trying to be ahead of the curve well, I, I would be surprised if we're not but um, you know you might be asking for a reason then you so. may be surprised <laughs> um, so I would I'd ask as well uh, Rena, um, just coming to you, actually, you mentioned district heating there, um, Catherine, and I want to come to you, Rena, to ask, on, on district heating, I've had dealt with a, a number of issues uh, in Sutton and Walthamstow around uh, how district heating can cause a lot of cost to residents. Is this something you've come across in your council, and, and how do you think we can get to a point where we use district heating, but it's also not cost costly to residents? I have a problem answering that more broadly. I mean, I know from discussions with officers previously that there have been some earlier district heat networks that don't work so well, um, and in fact haven't been any more efficient than, than, than an, an alternative form of heating. I think one of the um, one of the things that for Islington in particular, so in the London boroughs, we do have challenges with um, sometimes solar, but certainly other generations like wind, um, and that. So actually, looking at district heat networks is really really important for us. And we've got a flagship um, project, in fact, with TfL and um, obviously GLO support around how you take waste heat from, um, from um, in this case, it's from the tube station. So it's basically a, um, a disused tube station. And that's now um, f um, power, um, heating homes, a couple of um, leisure centres. Um, and that's, that's a concept I think we're looking to expand. In that circumstance, the, the, the heating is at a lower cost to residents than... Um, than, than otherwise, but I say that's a particular project. Um, I don't, I can't really help you any further, sort of with the, with a broader concept, except to understand that actually the, the sort of earlier generations haven't always been the answer to um, the answer that they perhaps were, were put up to be. Um, but I, I suspect they change from they're very variable. Um, if I might suggest uh, that Caro would have views on this because I know that Citizens Advice Bureau have done some um, research on district heating recently. Um, but you know, it's a it's an area where um, the, the subject the price cap has not applied. It hasn't been regulated by Ofgem in the same way as sort of yeah, individual customers have been. Although in December last year, the government did announce that Ofgem would come in, um, and I think that's welcome uh, because that will give greater certainty to consumers. Uh, Rowena. Um, so the, James Wilson, who's the head of energy service, I think he's got some comments that he could, he thought might be helpful. If that was all right. It, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm sorry, actually, just say, I don't know if Clara's in the section, but she did want to add anything then. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I was yeah. actually kind of going to echo um, what Catherine said really about the, the, the issue with district heating networks is that the sector is currently unregulated. And so that there is, you know, there's, um, the, you know, there's, um, there's no caps. And yeah, but this hopefully will be resolved in the near future if, if proper regulation is brought in. Thank you. Um, Cara, I know you stepped away from your desk for a moment. I don't know how much of a conversation you caught, but it was just to see if you wanted to come in here at all from a point of view of citizens' advice. Um, yeah, so on sort of district heating, we have looked at that not necessarily in terms of um, efficiency of those networks, but more in terms of the like customer satisfaction and use of those networks. Uh, so you may have seen some research we've published recently on, on customer service and things like that, but we haven't necessarily looked at um, sort of the, the overall efficiency and just more the customer experience of those. Um, I do know that you know there is there is obviously work going on to prepare for regulation. So yeah, we do hope that there would be some improvements, improvements there in the next few years. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, that's really helpful. And I'm glad some of the issues with district uh, heatings being acknowledged here. And I hope that's something we can build into perhaps a report um, and perhaps, you know, Arena looking forward to the uh, perhaps the big Edmonton incinerator project and the, the impact that the district heating network could have on residents there, just being very aware of the issues and how we make sure that it's successful. But just say it was really interesting that project on TfL. It's not something I've heard of before. So uh, any details on that? If you've got more details, it sounds really interesting. I hadn't heard of it. Did you want me to go to the next section or did the only Yeah, absolutely. So we'll move on to section two, which is pathways to net zero carbon by 2030 and public private finance. And we're going to stick with Assembly Member Best. 
Uh, thanks, Catherine. Coming back to, back to you, does the mayor require any few f further devolved powers to achieve uh, energy efficiency measures required to achieve net zero by 2030? So the big distinction that we see in London is that the mayor has powers, of course, um, over new developments, and the London plan sets out very clearly the guidance and expectations, uh, and I mentioned that already. Um, where it comes to the existing building stock, the mayor has very few powers. We have some spending programs, things like warmer homes, uh, you know, very welcome that we can help a few thousand Londoners, but it's hundreds of thousands of Londoners now who are in fuel poverty. Um, I think, you know, I've said uh, that the mayor would like to see a fair share of funding devolved to London, um, but there's also a question if central government is not going to act as quickly uh, as would be needed for us to reach net zero by 2030, uh, where it comes to regulating the existing building stock, then, you know, of course the mayor would be glad to receive uh, further powers on that so that he could achieve his goals. Thanks. Do you think that, I, I, like you say, you know, the, if the mayor's looking for further powers, but perhaps, you know, if we're not meeting our own standards, do you think that would, you said you're not sure if we're not meeting our own standards. If we weren't meeting our own standards, would that perhaps weaken the argument that we're not doing everything with the powers we already have? Um, I think that's a hypothetical question for me, as I don't know the case that you're referring to, and I obviously ought to go and look, look it up. Um, but the standards that uh, the London plan has set have been shown to improve the energy performance of buildings built in London by nearly 50% compared to uh, the national average. So, uh, you know, clearly the, the powers that the mayor does have are having some effect. The, the mayor could also, uh, he said he was going to uh, look towards powering the tube with 100% renewable source mm. electricity, yet the tender's gone out and um, it's only for 10% of renewable electricity. Do you think perhaps it would be a better uh, intention, you know, intention if, we, if that was a wider uh, percentage and perhaps that would make a better case for more powers for the mayor? Um, so the ambition for the 100%, I believe, is by the end of the decade. Uh, and so, you know, that's a step-by-step -step process. Um, you don't purchase all of the power. You don't enter into a single contract uh, for 100% all at once. So the mayor was really clear yesterday that that was the goal, but the first tender was going to be for 10%. Um, but we're already working on what will come next. Yeah, Thanks. we'd like to make progress quickly. Just on, on that then, it, that's really interesting. Just to, so when do you think perhaps we'll look towards, you know, because the end of the decade is going to come pretty pretty soon. Um, how, what's your projection then for percentage-wise? Um, I, I don't think I should make announcements in advance of the mayor. <laughs> do you think we'll see a, a growth on that 10% yes, quickly? Uh, I do think we'll see a growth on the 10%, yes. I, I know, but quickly, I was saying. <laughs> as, as <a laughs> Do you think in the next couple of years, perhaps, will, will we... I so mean, I, I'm not sure if the Mayor has talked about this in public, but certainly we're working to make sure that can happen as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, and just and on those uh, extra powers, what representations have the, has the Mayor and GLA made so far to government? Yeah. Um, so the, the Mayor has, um, has particularly focused his calls on uh, around the spending review and around fiscal events. Uh, calling both for greater devolution of uh, funding uh, according to London's fair share um, and critically looking at funding which is over several years. There's been a real tendency uh, in government to announce programmes um, with a lot of fanfare and then after one or two rounds, just as the market is getting used to them, whether that's individual consumers in households or businesses, um, then you know to get drawn onto the next thing, uh, close that fund and open another one. Um, and I, I speak as somebody who was working in the Department for Business until last November, so I know what the pressures were from ministers to, to come up with um, announceable new funds. Um, but it's really detrimental to the market uh, because people do take time to prepare. So we're seeing it at the moment with the public sector decarbonisation scheme, which you may have seen was... Uh, the, there have been rumours uh, in the press that that could get cannibalised in order to take some money away from it to put towards domestic retrofit. Um, the mayor has been really clear that you know he's all in support of further funding for domestic retrofit, but taking it from a scheme that has just got established, has been running for a couple of years, is is now getting a good response from the public sector, um, is not the way to do it. So that's one of the key asks that the mayor would have. Um, and when did the GL, uh, when was the last time the GLA wrote to the government to request a higher share of? Uh, ECA funding and w and what impact did it achieve? Sure. 
Um, so I'm certain that we wrote before the last spending review. I'm not sure if we've written since then. The spring statement, yeah, around the spring statement. Uh, and we have not received that higher proportion yet. Did you receive a response? I think we'll come back to you on that if that's all right, Councillor. You don't know if you received a response. Uh, so that that that, that letter would have gone in from uh, our government relations, which was taking uh, asks from all across the GLA's policy area. So it didn't come from um, from us specifically. But I'll check. Uh, what, so we didn't get anything back saying, uh, you know, you, you may now have your higher percentage of eco funding. So we know we didn't get what we asked for. And mm. um, I'd be quite surprised whether uh, either Bayes or Treasury wrote to everybody who sent them a representation. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to put on record too that I was very concerned about the 0.01% renewable energy that the mayor was putting into uh, TFL and I'm pleased to see it go up to 10%, but I agree that it seems pretty weak and I accept that you don't want to preempt the mayor and completely understand that, but just wanted to say that uh, if we're going to hit that 2030 target, it's going to have to move pretty quick. Assemblymember Buckhari. Just wanted to pick up on the fact that you've had a lack of response or you're not sharing that response right now. But what I want to clarify and get some clear, clear reasons or maybe even justifications of why you think maybe London is being proportionally underfunded compared to other regions in terms of the ECO funding. Have, have you got any kind of um, understanding of that? Yes, I do. So um, at the moment, eco funding is often spent uh, on properties where it's cheapest to achieve uh, carbon savings and energy savings um, and for various reasons that we've mentioned um, it can be more expensive in London partly because we've got conservation areas partly because the building stock is older partly just things like you know blocking parking or putting up scaffolding is more expensive in a um, in a quite dense city uh, and quite wealthy city with you know a lot of business going on um, that that sort of effect can mean that it's more more expensive to retrofit here and then if, if you're in charge of the eco budget and thinking, how do I do as many homes as possible, um, you may look outside London. So that's one of the reasons we don't get what the mayor would consider London's fair share. Thank you very much. Assemblymember Clark. Thank you, Chair. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Nadia, just coming back to you, um, we've talked about quite a bit today about um, energy efficiency of domestic homes. I'm just wondering where you think the mayor could go for further uh, to further increase energy efficiency in domestic homes in London, I mean, would that be through setting higher targets or other other measures, perhaps? So I think it's important that we break down the domestic sector into, I would probably say, three different sections. Um, the first one would be social housing, the second one would be the fuel poor, and the third one would be homeowners or landlords. Um, there are different challenges within each sector and different needs within each sector. Mm -hmm. um, I would probably say on social housing, um, there needs to be more support for local authorities to actually have more capacity and, and more knowledge to deal with this sector. Um, so at the current um, moment, it is down to the officers from local authorities to apply for funding to upgrade their social housing stock. It varies greatly across different local authorities how much funding has been applied for, if any at all. Um, it's also important, I would say, again, to involve community energy enterprises here. Um, we see that lots of um, ALMOs or arm's length management organisations are the ones who have to deal with energy efficiency for social housing, but they have, a, uh, uh, I would say, a somewhat poor understanding of the need um, and, and where that should be uh, delivered uh, most urgently. So. Again, using community networks, using community energy groups is crucial to identifying where to sort of send this, this, uh, these funds first. And there's also a challenge within the supply chain here. Um, so there are kind of lots of barriers to local contractors winning um, uh, tenders for this work. Uh, I think we've got to really think about the procurement methods that we use within social housing and kind of large-scale retrofit projects and enable more local contractors to be able to build up their skills, get the qualifications that they need, and um, and not always have big companies that are subcontracting and subcontracting and subcontracting the work to companies from outside of London uh, to do that work. 
So um, that that's for social housing. I would say for the, for the next um, sector on fuel poverty, um, this is split again into homeowners and uh, tenants. Um, we've talked a little bit about homeowners who tend to be, you know, asset rich but cash poor. Um, very important to acknowledge. Um, and there are different methods and different financing solutions that these homeowners can potentially use in future, uh, but they are not taken up um, at the minute um, on, on a large scale, um, if at all. Um, so we have started to see different financing solutions like um, green mortgages and, and refinancing uh, with certain banks giving you re refi or the ability to refinance for green solutions. Um, we also uh, think about equity release when we think of especially pensioners who have you know, paid off their mortgage and worked hard all their lives to do that, um, but then don't really have the cash flow to upgrade their properties. Um, with regard to tenants, it is a bit of a tougher situation. It is very much down to the landlord to take action. There are a few issues here. Um, the first issue is that the current uh, minimum energy efficiency standards, which we mentioned earlier, are, I would say, not ambitious enough. Uh, but more importantly, that they are not being policed quite enough. The reason that they're not being policed enough is that local authorities, again, don't have the capacity to deal with this. Um, so we really need to improve on that. Um, and again, looking at the supply chain here, uh, supporting local contractors to get qualified to pass 2030 and pass 2035 um, certification is, is important um, so that they can you know, access and, and do these work under grant funded schemes uh, like um, Warmer Homes, which we think is an absolutely brilliant scheme. Um, it's worth mentioning we have referred tons of people to, to the Warmer Home Scheme and continue to actually teach other community energy groups how to do this as well um, because it is quite a lengthy process to actually apply. Um, so it's, it's important that homeowners and tenants and landlords are supported through that process to apply for Warmer Homes as well. Um, for the final uh, sort of sector and I would this is what we would probably call the able to pay market um, of, of homeowners and, and landlords. Um, I think some incentives here could be a low cost financing solution. Um, Warmer Homes does offer some incentive for landlords and it is a very good incentive uh, paying uh, up to two thirds of the cost of retrofit uh, within a certain budget. Um, and we've seen landlords really, really keen to take that up uh, where they are meeting the right requirements and their tenants are in uh, on low incomes or in fuel poverty. Um, again, there's a there's another issue here with local uh, contractors. Um, there is really a lack of framework around retrofit, uh, especially for the the homeowners and the domestic able to pay sector. Um, we think what is required really is a full retrofit design service. Um, there is something that is currently available through an organization called Retrofit Works, which is a cooperative of contractors. Um, and it's essentially a toolkit, uh, a framework and a piece of software that sits behind it to really tailor for every single home what the steps to retrofit are and what action needs to be taken. And it's really crucial that um, retrofit coordinators are involved in this process because it's quite complex, um, it's quite lengthy, and it's not something that homeowners should have to uh, sort of take a bite of and chew off all on their own because it is a very daunting prospect as well to um, think about retrofitting your home and, you know, and have your life go on around that that big change within your home. Okay, so you. I would say those Sorry. are the, those are yeah. the key areas for improvement. Th that was a very comprehensive answer and, and really insightful. So I'm I'm glad I asked it. Just just going back to your first point about social um, about social homes, and you were saying that some local authorities hadn't applied for grants. Um, was there a reason for that? And were the ones who did apply were they all successful? Um, I wouldn't know the answer to that directly. Okay. Um, as far as I'm aware. Applying for the grants is, is down to the local authorities um, officers to, to, to make those applications. Um, we have seen across different boroughs, um, there 
is different there are different levels of capacity and different levels of interest in in applying for these grants um whether it sits with the housing team whether it sits with the energy team whether the housing and the energy teams actually talk to each other or not is really important to think about as well but i'm sure some of my colleagues have some points on this here yeah. so uh, i'd uh, step in and talk about uh, one of the um accelerators that we run out of the GLA called Retrofit Accelerator Home. So that's, mm -hmm. that is designed to help um, social housing providers um, get some of this technical support and advice that they need to kick off their, their projects and help them apply for, for some of this government funding and then help them make their business cases internally to, to free up their own capital. So we've been, we've been working with sort of a number, number of boroughs to do that in, in terms of which ones come to us and which ones don't. I think you'll find it's this, the same sorts of reasons that um, sort of Nadia has talked about in terms of ha having the capacity and knowledge um, and, and sort of wherewithal in, 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 in different um, sort of boroughs to be able to do that and sort of you know ha how well that's been funded within within each borough. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, Catherine, I'm going to pick on you next. Um, I'm just wondering how confident, um, how confident are you that the GLA will achieve its target? of the 37% heat demand savings across domestic buildings by 2030. Uh, so, you know, getting to net zero by 2030 has got some really huge requirements in there, um, including, uh, you know, over 200,000 homes to be retrofitted each year, um, and we are not anywhere near that right now. Um, even when you add together, you know, the, the few thousand that the GLA is uh, is retrofitting, what boroughs are doing, social housing providers, uh, and then householders themselves who can afford to pay, um, we are far off that. Uh, so that needs to accelerate rapidly um, in order to meet that. Um, and also, you know, putting in place over two million heat pumps in this decade. Uh, there's, again, some central government funding but central government imagines that there'll be about 2 million heat pumps across the whole of the UK by that point, and that is London's aim. Um, so we, you know, I'm absolutely not going to celebrate high energy prices. I think it is concentrating the mind and it's changing the conversation and people's awareness of the emergency of the climate change crisis is, is also growing and is some, you know, two or three years ago, it, I just don't think we would have been having these sorts of conversations about the need to get to net zero, the need to do it uh, within a decade. So I am optimistic um, that that kind of change of attitude uh, can lead to an acceleration. But uh, if you just if we kept doing what we're doing this year, um, we wouldn't hit that target in 2030. Yeah, thank, thanks. For that. And I'm just just curious, what additional work um, do, do you feel we would need be need, uh, needing to do to to achieve it? And and do you have any idea how that would be funded? So, you know, it has to be a mix of public and private funding. Um, you know, we've talked about how London would like to get a bigger share of, uh, of national government funding. And I think there is something to be said um, for uh, central government, uh, you know, lending its support where politicians in cities or city regions are willing to, to you know, adopt challenging targets and do things that, you know, uh, require explaining to the population whether that's buildings or transport or anything else. Um, you know, and I think London has shown leadership there, and so we should have a good case uh, to central government to get a higher proportion of the funding. But the sort of scale um, that is required, uh, according to the Element Energy report that we published in January, alongside the Mayor's Net Zero 2030 pathway, um, says we would need £75 billion of climate-related investment in London by 2030. Now, you know, even if we got all of central government funding in this area right now, um, we wouldn't get £75 billion. So that has to come as a mix of public and private. Um, and we have to come up with business models that make it possible for us to access that finance. And we know that there's increasing uh, ambition from investors to find green projects to, to put their money in. You know, we hear um, that there are trillions of, of dollars worth of investment just looking um, for a good home. Uh, we have to be able to tell the story that there's a payback uh, and 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 at the moment it, that's still a struggle um as energy prices go up the payback looks better um as the cost of retrofitting comes down as we get more experience again that gets better um as government regulation tightens up and we have these min minimum energy efficiency standards 
um, again, you know, it, it sort of becomes a more viable investment proposition, but that's not happening quickly enough. Um, so in investment from, uh, you know, from all of us, the GLA and others, in actually understanding those business models, I think is really essential. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Assemblymember Best. Thank you. I just want to ask something off the back of that, Catherine, is what proportion of the GLA and other functional bodies are currently powered by renewable energy? No, we'll come back to you on that. Uh, I, we have seen those stats. We do have them internally, but I'm afraid I don't have that to hand. Okay. D uh, do you have a ballpark on where that is at all? So I, th I think, actually, we've answered a mayoral question on that quite recently. Um, so I think it was in the public domain, and we'll, we can send that to you quickly. Yeah. Okay. Um, just I'll, 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 I'd ask as well how, what, you, what your plans are to increase this, but that's why I asked for a ballpark, because if you said it was 95%, I probably wouldn't ask that. But I, <laughs> so, so I suppose, you know, the, the GLA group, uh, like every consumer, draws from the grid, and as the grid has been cleaning up, um, our proportion that comes that way, sort of indirectly, has been, has been going up. Um, so that has been reducing our overall emissions, um, uh, although that's not... G the GLA's own policy intervention there. Um, we've installed solar PV uh, across the G GLA estate. Uh, London Fire Brigade has 70 stations. Met Police has 24 stations with solar panels. Um, TFL has done more than 10 sites. Um, and again, we're promoting that um, ourselves, and that's something that the Mayor's Green Bond can help with as well. And we're encouraging the functional bodies to take that up to invest in clean energy and energy efficiency measures. Um, but I'm afraid I don't have the stat that you asked for on renewable energy. Yeah, I, would, I would say I think at the moment all the functional bodies buy separately under separate contracts. Um, and with the, the PPA programme that we're looking to do and, and the, the group pro uh, procurement collaboration programme that, 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 that we're developing you know, looks to uh, sort of deliver a series of renewable PPAs. So, sort of in the future, it'll all be 100% renewable. Thanks. Um, moving on slightly, Catherine, again, to coming to you, though, if that's okay, is how will the GLA be monitoring the delivery and impact of the Mayor's uh, preferred pathway, the accelerated green pathway, with particular reference to building energy efficiency? Thank you. So um, every year we publish data, um, the, the leggy data on uh, London's climate emissions. Um, so that will be the overall uh, indication of whether our emissions are moving in the right direction or not. Well, they should be moving in the right direction, but are they going at the pace that we need? Um, you know, a year on year um, comparison can be confounded by other things that are going on in the economy, but we will start to see that uh, as we look over two or three years about whether we're we're on the right trajectory. Um, and on building energy efficiency, we certainly monitor the impacts of our own programmes. Um, and I believe that through the, some of the London plan um, assessments as well, we see that the, um, the applications that come to the mayor, uh, we have data on that too, so we can track that. Uh, I don't think we would be able necessarily to see the, uh, the energy performance of everything that goes to, uh, to individual boroughs, for example. I'd, I'd have to check, check on that and come back to you. Yeah, please. If you could, it, that'd be interesting to know if you could. So perhaps that's another stat you could get back with. Um, uh, Nadia, uh, what will be the most challenging elements of the pathway to net zero by 2030 for the mayor, in your opinion? That's a good question. Um, so uh, focusing specifically on energy efficiency and on, 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 on retrofit, um, I think one of the toughest challenges, well, I'll, I'll say there's two challenges. The first one being the retrofit supply chain. It is a challenge across the country. It's not a challenge that is specific to London. Um, but London being in the position that it's in, I think can definitely leverage the communities that it has um, to build this supply chain quite quickly. Um, when I talk about building the supply chain, um, f I'm firstly wanting to highlight that there's not enough local contractors to do the amount of retrofit that we need out there at the minute. Um, there has been investment uh, recently in green skills across the board, 
and um, we should definitely see some of that starting to come through within the next five to ten years especially the funding that has been allocated to colleges and training centers uh, and university on green uh, universities on green skills um, but it's crucial that we get this retrofit supply chain going straight away as soon as we can so I think dealing with the sort of teething problems that we've seen through the um, past 2030 and past 2035 certifications, um, dealing with the uh, different um, tenders that local authorities are, are putting out for retrofit and ensuring that these are really optimised for SMEs to be able to participate in is absolutely crucial. Um, I think the other piece of the puzzle really is about financing the retrofit. Um, it, it's definitely going to require a combination of different financing solutions across the board for different types of retrofit and different types of organisations. Um, I think when we talk about, um, we talked a little bit about financing earlier and actually I, I would say it's quite a um, view from a large corporate's perspective that there needs to be evidence of um, payback periods and, and, and payback times. I think when it comes to the work that I've personally been seeing in the domestic sector, especially within the able to pay market, people want to retrofit because it's the right thing to do and they want to retrofit because they want to be green. Um, and they also want to retrofit, funnily enough, because their neighbours are retrofitting. Uh, so I think there are different solutions out there. I don't think it necessarily needs to be based on payback periods, payback times, although obviously the cost of living has the crisis has uh, increased those um, or reduced those payback periods that, pe that people are waiting to um, have their money made back on. But um, I think that um, leveraging community finance, especially for the domestic sector and enabling community groups to be able to uh, put out share offers and have local investors invest and be able to give people funds to do their retrofit and then pay that back over a period of time is a really good uh, solution to start off with. I think when it comes to SMEs and businesses, um, small grants could be really helpful in, in uh, you know providing that push and that support that they need to actually start retrofitting. Um, and um, I would also just echo the, the comments that have been made about more uh, grant funding that is available and especially to support a capacity sup to support local authorities to be able to focus on this and, and have you know, individuals that are responsible for energy efficiency and responsible for retrofits solely um, within the organisations. Thanks. Just two quick follow-ups, Nadia. It, um do you think there's a, tr a training deficit exists or do you think it's just waiting for those who are being trained now to get to a point where they can do that work? Um, I think that a training deficit still exists uh, in terms of the long term. We are going to need more people working on this than we have training for it currently. Having said that, um, we have got a workforce of retrofit coordinators, retrofit assessors who currently haven't necessarily got the practical skills that they need to have. They've got the qualification, but they haven't worked on enough projects to be able to deliver them quickly and efficiently and uh, in the amount of depth that they need to be able to deliver them in. So I think making sure that we link up those people that have just been trained with the businesses that have already been working in the building sector for the past 10, 15, 20 years um, would be one of the most useful solutions there. Thank you. And finally, you covered the biggest challenges uh, to this. What do you think are the, perhaps on the other side, that the easiest wins that perhaps aren't happening but should be? Um, that's a good question. I mean, so some of the wins that we have um, that we have seen, I would say, for the fuel for the fuel poor sector is definitely warmer homes three. Um, we we think that it's a brilliant you know mechanism for supporting people the eligibility criteria we found is quite complex um and and hard to communicate but it is hitting we think the right people so i think building on that and increasing the availability of that um and and just making sure that the delivery of the scheme is as efficient and um smooth smooth running as it can be um 
we saw a brilliant scheme from national government called the Green Homes Grant, which uh, somewhat failed to deliver its, its targets, was not administered in the right way, and was um, a massive disappointment for a lot of people who had applied to the grant. Uh, and cause a lot of frustration for people. So we hope to see that the um, new grant for heat pumps will be delivered and administered in a much more efficient way and a way that is more accessible for people. Uh, from what we've been seeing so far, I think it's referred to as the boiler upgrade scheme, um, it has been sort of uh, it has been delivered in an efficient way, so we just hope that continues and that um, a more awareness is raised around that and more people can access that um, quite easily as well. Um, and I think finally, just you know, we've got some brilliant community energy enterprises all across London. Um, I believe in sort of all of the boroughs that are um, attending here as well, uh, and in many of your constituencies as well. So just making sure that um, community energy enterprises are embedded into the plans that are made for the um, uh, pathway to 2030, uh, and especially the local plans that are being made and the regional, um, the regional support mechanisms that are being delivered, I think is absolutely crucial. Uh, what we tend to find is community energy is just a bit of an add-on and it's an afterthought, um, whereas if it was embedded into those local plans, we would reach the people that we need to reach a lot quicker. We would have much better knowledge, knowledge of um, th the areas that we're working in and essentially the people of London and, and what they need. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblymember Buckhart. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about green bonds now um, and uh, earlier the London Assembly members were um, asked to consider a budget. Uh, unfortunately there was very little information on green bonds until, uh, until a very late stage uh, in the process when the final draft was consolidated um, in uh, February. So there's lots of unanswered questions there and there was quite vague answers that were coming through um, as well. Catherine, um, now, you know, I'm hoping that we've got some more clarity here. Um, when do you anticipate the first energy efficiency projects funded by uh, the GLA Green Bonds to actually start? So um, the mayor has said that he wishes to issue a prospectus for the first uh, tranche of the Green Bond um, by the end of this year. Uh, and then uh, it, it takes, I think, about three months uh, for that then to raise the finance and for that to be available for investment. Um, it's technically possible for that um, that investment to be spent or to contribute to projects that have already started uh, within, I think it's a couple of years either way. So either things have been started recently or are going to be uh, started and completed within a couple of years. Um, so it may be that that helps to supply some of the projects that the GLA is already doing, although obviously I'd like it to, and I know the mayor wants it, um, to, uh, to increase ambition and make things happen that wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, and the Mayor's noted the necessity of uh, additional private finance to achieving his net zero targets. Mm. Has the GLA explored sourcing private finance via the Mayor's Energy Efficiency Fund, the MEEF, to support domestic energy efficiency projects? So uh, I'm not sure about the, the MEEF and whether it's funded domestic. Um, I know it's certainly funded public and um, public sector, uh, things like heat networks, electric vehicle infrastructure, LED lighting and so forth. Um, I think the scale at which it's invested uh, has, you know, it's always been in the millions of pounds and therefore it's probably quite unlikely that it's been used for anything domestic related. But that, um, yeah, in, in principle, um, that you, you could use it particularly for things like um, housing associations or social housing. Uh, and that's something that the Green Bond is looking at. So as well as looking at the GLA's group's own uh, estate and fleets and thinking what we can do about that, we're also in July going to be going out um, with London councils uh, to the boroughs, to housing associations uh, and other public sector partners uh, to ask what ideas they have for how uh, a Green Bond and finance that flows from it could be useful. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to bring Nadia into this because you were talking about uh, the need for grants for retrofitting 
Um, and do you think that you know there there are you know do you want to add to that in terms of the link to the to to this to the green bond initiatives, um, utilising the the public fi private finance uh, initiatives that the mayor has to improve energy efficiency in domestic buildings? Is that something that you know we could do more on? Yeah, absolutely. I think here um, again with the domestic buildings, it's it's such a large proportion of the. Uh, homes that need to be retrofitted that you have to ensure that the communities that are having their homes retrofitted are on board and are really keen to do this. Um, grants are a good way to start off with but if the supply chain is not there people are going to get frustrated with what's happening very quickly despite it being free money and grants. Um, so I would just go back and focus on the need for a um, retrofit design service and a process for for the domestic sector to be developed as a priority. Um, when I say retrofit design service, we really have to contextualize that in the in in terms of knowing that every property, every single property is different. And it's not different down to the archetype of the building necessarily, although there are tons of archetypes of buildings across London. Um, but it's different in terms of how the homeowner uses the home, what their long-term plans are, um, and, and um, you know, what level of disruption they want to have within the home when they retrofit as well. So um, I think focusing on just having that retrofit design service available and accessible for homeowners and, and, uh, and landlords um, is really one of the main pieces of the puzzle that needs to be um, that needs to be considered. Um, yeah, and in, in terms of uh, financing, I can't say that I've personally come um, across the Mayor's Energy Efficiency Fund uh, in too much detail before. I have heard of it, but I, again, would assume that most of this funding has been focused on larger buildings and larger organisations. And I would just, again, echo the importance of you know, bringing smaller buildings and smaller organisations into the mix here, especially SMEs who, you know, were firstly hit by COVID and secondly have been hit by the energy price hikes again. Is that something, Catherine, that you, you will be looking into then? Yes, actually, if I could just pick up on what Nadia said about the social housing and need for capacity building, essentially. Um, that was something that the GLA was very involved in in 2021-22 through the Social Housing Retrofit Accelerator. Um, which grew out of a program that we ran in London, uh, looking towards grant funding from central government, which was significant, but people didn't know how to apply or they didn't have projects or they weren't confident about it. Um, and so we ran a lot of masterclasses, briefings, trainings, workshops, etc. cetera. Um, and Bayes actually liked the way that we'd done that in London and invited us to do it for all of England um, as well. So for a year, we ran that service uh, all, all across the country um, and trained 5,000 people, 725 organisations <coughs> to come up with those sorts of projects and put them in for that central grant funding. Um, and out of the 69 total bids that Bayes accepted, 66 had been supported by the GLA through that social housing retrofit accelerator service. Um, so we were really proud of that. Uh, Bayes has now decided to do that uh, in-house. So they've adopted uh, our, our methodology and we've spent time with them talking about what worked, what didn't. Um, but I just, just to agree that that kind of hand-holding, I think, is really important. And that's even when you're chasing grants. Um, when you then start to ask the question about, well, what about a green bond and, or a loan or private finance and it's got to have a payback, um, that, I think that will take even more time explaining you know, coming up with the business models as well. Thank you very much. Um, we're now halfway through our meeting, so we're going to suggest we have a five-minute comfort break. Uh, so I make the time 11.18, so if I could ask everyone to return promptly at 11.23. That's 11.23. Thank you very much.
and welcome back from your break. Thank you very much. And we are going to commence with our section three, which is on the Mayor's Energy Efficiency Initiatives. Um, and I'd like to reopen with Catherine. Catherine, have all homes in the Energy Leap Initiative now been completed? Um, no, they haven't. Uh, five have been completed and two are going to be completed by September. And so September will be the date when you expect everything to have been completed by? Uh, yes, that's right. We originally started off with eight, but one resident withdrew. So seven uh, is now what we're targeting. Uh, five have been done, two yet to come. Well, two being done. Yeah. Thank you. And can I ask, what will the GLA learn from the Energy Leap Initiative that will inform future retrofit work? Sure. So one of the things we've been looking at is actually what is the energy performance of the buildings after they've been retrofitted. Um, the, the concept of Energy Leap is to do a full building retrofit, so it's not just you know, doing a loft or a wall, but it's, um, it's doing lots of measures. Uh, and the initial uh, assessments looking over a few months of uh, energy performance um, is that it's a more than 60% reduction in, in energy consumption. Um, we haven't done a full year's cycle yet, uh, but once we do that, we will understand better. Um, and, and more to the point, I guess, um, the residents uh, and the, the building companies and everybody else involved in the project uh, will learn what the performance has been. And, and that has been one of the real issues is that this sort of deep retrofit is not yet common enough that people can make standard assumptions and then plan on that basis both of, um, of how to price the work uh, and then also how much they're willing to pay for it um, so so that will that information will be useful um, it feeds into what we describe as um, the innovation partnership which is is following a tried and tested four stage process um, that goes from the research and development through to uh, prototyping of a small number of homes, learning from that, testing, refining, scaling up, then doing a few hundreds, uh, and then commercialization and delivery. Um, so we've now had uh, seven London-based social housing providers uh, who are ready to invest to deliver about 1,800 homes. So we go from that small, let's try it on a, on a few individual homes, learn from it, and then build the confidence that it can be delivered at a larger scale. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Assemblymember Bokhari. Thank you. Um, so one of the retrofit accelerator for home project objectives was to have 1,678 homes either fully retrofitted, in the process of being retrofitted, or in contract to being retrofitted by August 2022. How many homes have been retrofitted to date and are you on track to meet that target? Now, we've talked about this earlier, but it would be like some clarity on that. Uh, so what I can say is that over 1,800 whole house retrofits have been contracted through the Mayor's um, Retrofit Accelerator Homes Innovation Partnership. So the contracting has happened. Uh, I can't tell you uh, exactly where they've all got to in terms of have they started, what's the process of installation, but they've been contracted. What, what are your hopes that you'll be on target? So, um, judging by that definition that you said about them by August 22, yeah. essentially they, they turn into concrete projects. I would say that if you've contracted them, the chances of them happening are, are very good. Um, but uh, I can come back to you with more information on that. If okay, you great. That would be great. Uh, now that the government shared prosperity fund has allocated money to the GLA, can we expect further extension? on the retrofit accelerator yeah. so the um the retrofit accelerators were partly funded by city hall but also partly by european funding um, which of course comes to an end uh, next year so we um as all of the programs uh, across the gla and uh, across london councils and uh, and the rest um will be thinking about what our priorities are do we want to take advantage of any um, greater flexibility offered by UK SPF compared to the European funds, which had their own criteria. Um, so, it, you know, we will be designing those programmes uh, over the course of the next months. Um, but it is the case that UK SPF funding for London is less than the European funding was. So, we will have to think creatively and uh, and really prioritise the most important. You, you will be hoping to extend that further, though. Um, so, we're certainly, you know. This sort of support, as we've just discussed, is really important um, because people aren't able, whether it's uh, social housing providers, whether it is uh, public sector organisations, uh, you know, all the rest, at the moment, they're not able to come up with the projects by themselves quickly enough 
for what the mayor wants to achieve for net zero so, so there are challenges so, ahead yeah. is that what you're saying um i'm saying that that kind of support is essential but yeah. we will have to make the case um for why that is the best investment of uk's uh, shared prosperity fund and city hall funding okay all right thank you thank you and joining us remotely is assembly member mccartney assembly member mccartney yes thank you chair chair can i just check has question five been answered in previous <laughs> questions i've got a feeling it was perhaps in the first section and um, we've touched on it but it's probably worth getting clarity on it fine the, the, then the question is for Catherine if I can and that's looking at the warmer homes grants are there any groups of Londoners that are proving very difficult to reach and um, for, for example owner occupiers or renters or is there anything else you've identified so I'm aware that the, the biggest challenge I think we're facing is getting to the really energy inefficient homes. Um, and that's not a demographic question so much as an EPC question. And that comes down to having the right data and also the, um, the right outreach. Uh, the conditions that Bayes put on the funding that they've given to us um, are that are, is a high proportion ought to go to the most energy inefficient homes. And that is because they have by far the largest fuel bills um, you know, it can be several multiples of, even if you've got an EPCC, you know, by the time you're EPCF, it's a lot worse. Um, and that's a relatively small proportion of London's housing stock, um, and, and that's what we have to find. Um, so that's what we're, we're aiming our marketing campaign at at the moment. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else want to add anything? If I could just come in on this one. Um, so what we found with the Warmer Homes uh, scheme and you know, fuel poverty alleviation support more widely is it tends to be a little bit harder to um, support people who are from ethnic minority communities and um, are, are speaking um, other languages and don't speak English. Um, I know that community groups have an advantage in accessing these um, these people of these demographics, uh, you know, because we, for example, employ energy advisors who give advice in Spanish, give advice in uh, Bengali, give advice in the languages that uh, are most common in our communities. Um, so I'd say that that's one area of the uh, of the sector that has uh, been more widely a little bit hard to target. Um, we've also found that it's quite hard to target landlords and find landlords um, we think that is because landlords don't have as many community forums uh, as uh, as other areas of the community have um, so we are currently working on how we can you know penetrate that market a little bit more as well thank you and I don't know whether um, Catherine or Rowena had any comments on that last um, point that's been made, particularly about landlords. So I suppose one of the issues, of course, um, with, with warmer homes and landlords is both the landlord and the tenant has to be up for uh, the, the work, which is a bit different from owner occupied. You just have to you know, deal with one, the one uh, customer. So that, but nonetheless, we have had take up um, and applications uh, from that sector. And, you know, I agree on the language side of things. Um, at the moment, our marketing has all been in English, but it is something we're really aware of. But are you going to do anything about it? So we have a budget for marketing and we're trying to figure out the most effective way of getting to the Londoners who need it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I then ask Cara a question, if I can? We've heard earlier on about um, the groups of people that are perhaps targeted with support and advice. And I think this seems quite different this time round because it looks like many Londoners in different groups are all suffering from high energy costs. So can I just ask you from your background with the CIB, um, is that your experience? And what support do people need now um, with their energy costs? And how do you anticipate that's going to change over the next six months to a year? Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, on targeting, um, I think, I mean, we don't have the same sort of on the ground experience that Nadia has, but in general, those were some of the questions that we would have had about this scheme is, you know, the identification and um, whether it's self-referral and things like that. So yeah, we are very aware that what is, what potentially was 
um, the people that were in need is now changing and that group is growing, um, especially as we're going into winter now. So we're kind of wondering as well if there's uh, anything to consider around updating application criteria um, so that the people that are struggling maybe are not the ones that were originally sort of uh, targeted by the scheme, but are still Go, are still going to be struggling this, this winter. So um, is there a way to sort of change the low household income threshold, uh, things like that? So yeah, we are very, um, whether we are just, we're seeing more and more people. So I think um, some of the latest sort of figures that we have are from January 1st to June 23rd this year, we've helped more than 115,000 people access crisis support, um, which is 50% higher than the same time last year and it's almost 200 percent increase on the same period in 2019 um, we've also seen many more people contacting us about prepayment meters um, and also extreme uh, increase on traffic to our website on grants and benefits to help you pay your energy bills so we know people are struggling and they're looking for help um, i think yeah we'd, i mean we're just going to see that kind of that trend that trend continue. I think I, I don't see that really changing. I think um, in terms of energy efficiency measures, while some of them will make um, immediate savings, not all of them necessarily will. So there's that balance to be made as to what investments uh, are put in into retrofit. Are we making sure that we're increasing energy efficiency as well as decarbonizing, or are we, you know, focusing on one or the other? And I think that right now it just it really needs to be a fabric first and, and worst first approach to at least reduce some of that energy consumption so that people do have a little bit more sort of financial headspace yeah thank you and i think that's that's really telling about the um amount of need that has really increased over the last couple of years can i just ask is the cab aware of the, the mayor's warmer homes advice service is it something you use and if so, how would you like to see that developed in future? And um, so I don't know if it's something that local offices would um, refer people to. I'm, I'm not sure. So I can check on uh, sort of referral rates in that at, at a local level um, in terms of increasing and improving the scheme. Um, what we think is that, you know, it's it's great. It's a it's a really um, generous. The amounts are generous. Um, but our data is kind of suggesting that around 6% of properties nationally are going to cost over £20,000 to decarbonise, um, and that's 2% probably going to cost over £25,000. Um, so it's just considering what to do in those cases where the funding is not going to meet, you know, the, the need. Um, is it, you know, there's, there's, also, there's like things to consider around whether you try to treat the most houses to a lower level or treat fewer houses completely um, and where where's that funding gap kind of met from um, it would be really interesting to hear from uh, staff here if if you do know uh, the answer um, something that we we've had a question of is how far will the, the funding go um, are there estimates of the number and the cost of treatments um, and you know what are the strategies just because obviously there are merits to both maximizing the number but also the quality of retrofit um so yeah that that's kind of something that we'd have a question we'd have for the scheme at the moment and then for the future i think what we're kind of i think it's been touched on before we we're concerned that there's been a lot of sort of policy signals that suggest it's now a time to you know we've got this scheme or that scheme then they've been cancelled and just as consumers are getting kind of um aware, becoming aware of them or just as the industry is starting to respond with with skills and experience so we'd really want to see funding committed and um, to just give consumers that confidence um, and we really need to i mean we've got our, our data suggests that over half of the homes in london are below epcc so this is a big it's a big challenge and i think you know we need to see a commitment that's that's commensurate to the challenge so we kind of think at a local level what could be done um, is setting out a roadmap for the assembly's target. So how you're going to get to that 37% by 2030, um, committing resources to support local authorities to build knowledge, expertise and capacity to make sure they have the ability to handle the increase in retrofit actions. So, you know, if we're successful in increasing demand, actually, is there going to be a bottleneck anywhere um, building control in planning departments, etc.? Is that capacity there? 
um, we'd be interested in the creation of a London-wide framework so boroughs are clear on what they need to be doing and how. Um, so that could include a forum for boroughs to come together to share progress or challenges and best practice. Um, we're interested in the monitoring of the delivery of local area energy plans to make sure the targets are being met by each borough. And then one area where there's a significant gap in, in our opinion is an advice provision and consumer awareness. There is no sort of national advice framework for energy efficiency. And I think that is a, a really big um, a big issue. I think Nadia mentioned it earlier that a reason for people wanting to retrofit is because their neighbours have retrofit. Um, and if that's the only place that people are getting uh, information from, there's a huge gap and there's a huge um, sort of area there for problems to arise, such as scams or poorly done work or that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think advice is, is going to be really key, key to this and making sure that what is done is the right treatment and it's done in the right way and it's done in a way that consumers understand and on board with. Thank you. And that you very nicely prompted my next question. So I'm going to go to Nadia if I can. And Cara's just given us uh, a list of some really helpful things that she thinks perhaps the mayor and the government could do in future. Is there anything you want to add to that list with regards to domestic energy efficiency? You talked earlier about small businesses and schools, for example, but in the domestic energy efficiency market. Um, so just before I forget, I'll touch on her point about local uh, citizens advice um, organisations referring to warmer homes. I think there are um, some local ones that are referring to warmer homes. We have actually partnered with citizens advice in the past on energy advice. The reason uh, I wanted to highlight this is when it comes to fuel poverty, usually a person who is in fuel poverty will have multiple issues and it won't just be energy bills it will be debt it will be issues with um the the benefits that they can access it will be issues with disabilities um or they you know have mental health issues need befriending services and similar so i think um as a first i just wanted to make that point before i forgot about it it's crucial to make sure that when we're delivering fuel poverty alleviation services they are linked in with other services uh, for vulnerable people within the community because you can't just tackle this issue of fuel poverty on its own it's always linked to multiple things when someone lives in a house that has a lot of damp and mold their mental health is going to be severely impacted because of that damp and mold um, and they're not going to be able to deal with uh, debt from their energy supplier if their if their mental health is not in a good place and they've got tons of other things to deal with so um just yeah just wanted to make that point before i move on but um i agree with yeah i agree with the the um point made about more long-term uh funding uh and um more stable uh you know funding streams and and schemes i think what we we would like to see is a london-wide or a regional approach to retrofit um, and for those uh, funding schemes to be, um, you know, as mentioned before, reliable and, and long term. Retrofit is something that, you know, it does take a long time to actually deliver. It can be months between us putting in an application um, for grant funding and people having the retrofit assessment and people getting the measures installed in their properties. It can be a really, really long time. Um, and the most frustrating thing is when you know, someone wants to apply and then the deadline is changed or the, um, you know, the, the contractors aren't able to, to deliver the install in time. So I think um, long term funding is crucial, not just for the satisfaction of the people that we're uh, installing, the, the, uh, that we're, you know, installing the measures for in their homes, but also for the benefit of organisations that are working in this space. Um, in terms of our fuel poverty advisors, it is a really complex job to be able to support people that have very different needs and, and very complex needs. And, you know, the grant funds are very complex to be able to access and constantly changing. So to train these people up and to have them work throughout winter and then to say, actually, this summer we don't have enough funding to employ you and then go find another job and then to have to retrain people the next winter and start all over again is just a bit of a nightmare process. So if we can have some funds that offer that fuel poverty service all throughout the year or over a number of years, I think that would be very beneficial. 
Thank you. And, and Catherine, my final question, the fuel povel sorry the fuel poverty partnership can you just update us on what action that's taking at the moment um, and may i just very briefly add um on the referring bodies and the connections with those who are dealing with health or social care um the, the warm homes advisory service that the um, the mayor sponsors has connections with over 300 referring bodies um, and that includes the fire brigade nhs uh, voluntary sector organizations um and so we do get referrals from people who are looking at that kind of wider set of social needs um, and from this autumn, as well as providing the advice on energy saving, um, that the services will also be helping to make sure that the um, people who are coming to us are also ac accessing all possible benefits, uh, because that's something they you know, may, may not know how to do and, um, and it would obviously be of help as well. Just on the Fuel Poverty Partnership, um, yes, so that was convened in May um, most recently. It brings together um, people from many different sectors, uh, local government, social housing, landlords, tenants, academia, NGOs, uh, energy suppliers, etc. Um, it's co-chaired by our Deputy Mayors for Environment and Energy um, and also Communities and Social Justice, and that recognises the interconnected uh, nature of the problem. Um, we came up with a work plan for the rest of this year, uh, which is going to focus on four immediate priorities. Uh, that is the immediate cost of living crisis, uh, tackling the health impacts of cold homes, just mentioned, um, a particular focus on the private rented sector, um, and then finally the just, de just decarbonisation of heat, doing that in a fair way. Um, so each of those has now got a task and finish group set up um, and we will be taking forward actions and lobbying vis-a-vis uh, -vis central government um, through that partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Rowena, you indicated quite a while ago. Apologies, it's for pitfalls of hybrid meetings. No, it's fine. Actually, um, points I want to be made both by both Nadia and Catherine. Um, I think just to confirm that, that um, the CAB do refer to Shine um, and it is actually a gateway as well as an advice service um, to support other people. But I won't repeat the points that have already been made. Appreciated. Thank you very much. Assemblymember Buck Harry. Um, I wanted to pick up on something that Rowena said a while ago about, um, she, she said pensioners, but older Londoners. Um, and they're the, probably one of the most digi digi digitally ex uh, excluded groups in, Lon of, uh, uh, in London. And I'm worried that the things like the scheme, like the warmer home scheme, may not be... Um, getting through to that particular group. So has there been any specific outreach there, Catherine, uh, with that particular group? Um, so I, th I think with that group, um, we're looking to, to get through uh, some of these other agencies, so like the NHS and, and also the, um, the mail out that we're doing at the moment, that, that, is, a, that is a mail out rather than a digital mail out. So ho hoping sort of working with boroughs to try and identify the right um, you know the right sort of people to target to help. Great, and and now Nadia and, and Cara, um, you're probably aware aware of this, but the Mayor of London established a cost of living hub. Again, this is online. Uh, it gives financial practical advice, but it also includes energy advice. Um, have you been referring your uh, people to this hub at all? Um, are people aware of it as a resource generally? Do you think uh, there needs to be some further support so that the Mayor of London is helping communicate that advice better uh, to the Londoners that you're talking to? So should we go to Nadia first and then Cara? So I personally haven't heard of the Cost of Living Hub. <laughs> Um, that's very interesting <laughs> yeah I probably shouldn't I should probably clarify I don't uh, work directly on the fuel poverty side of the organization so our advisors may refer to the cost of living hub although I haven't heard them talk about it which means they probably don't um, I suppose one thing to note is when it comes to energy advice and energy efficiency and retrofit I would question the how useful it is to have generic advice, essentially. Um, I think most of the advice we deliver is effective because it is personalised and it is one-to-one -one advice. Um, we do a lot of work 
you know, you mentioned digital exclusion earlier. I think that's a really important, really important thing to take into account. And it has been for a number of years. Um, as we're seeing the growth in the number of people that need to access uh, fuel poverty alleviation services, we are not seeing that that growth is coming from the sector that is digitally excluded. We're actually starting to give more advice over WhatsApp, over Facebook um, and, and video calls now. Um, but it's still very prevalent and it's still very important. Um, so yeah, we don't personally, as far as I'm aware, we don't personally use that, but I can look into that and confirm uh, after the session. Thank you. And and Cara, have you have you uh, given um, any one advice to go to the uh, cost of living hub at all? Uh, so again, I I don't work on the advice uh, side of the organisation, so I wouldn't be aware. But I will look into it. But just on advice, again, I'll I'll echo what Nadia has just said that generic advice is not helpful in this area. Um, it needs to be tailored. It needs to be high quality. It needs to be bespoke. Uh, we we can't give i mean i think you know even just this the target of epc3 epcs and the sap ratings are also quite generic and they're not necessarily going to be the most helpful um treatments for an individual's home and um, so something that we've we've called on the uk government to implement is a net zero homes guarantee that would provide that high quality tailored advice but would also provide protection to consumers at the moment there's just no protection in this area if something goes wrong what do you do? There's no redress scheme. There's nowhere to turn. Um, so we're definitely seeing an increase in people looking for advice from us on what to do actually after. Not only before something has happened, we don't necessarily see that kind of um, that kind of information seeking, but we're really seeing an increase in people coming to us for help when something has actually already gone wrong. And those can be really, really costly mistakes. So um, yeah, we, we really desperately need that, that advice for people to stop them making those mistakes in the first place. Okay. Thank you, Assemblymember Best. Thank you. Um, Catherine, just coming to you, the previous mayor set up the refit programme for re retrofitting public sector buildings, and that's since been renamed into Retrofit Accelerator Workplaces. Could you let me know the success of that programme and how many public buildings have been uh, retrofitted? It's a good question. So uh, while Chet hunts for the numbers, um, I can say that I know that it's been a really good feeder for the public sector decarbonisation scheme, um, and it's helped us access over £170 million worth of public sector grants that have come into London uh, with the technical advisory support in order to come up with those projects. And, and the latest numbers are um, over 560 public sector buildings since 2016, helping to save 22,000 tonnes of carbon and uh, 87 megawatt hours of energy each year. Brilliant, thank you. And um, similarly, the previous mayor set up the Renew Home Retrofit Programme, uh, which is slightly aligned to the the current mayor's Retrofit Accelerator Programme. Um, that's only proposing to retrofit 1,600 homes compared to the previous scheme, which retrofitted 130,000. So what's the reasoning behind such a, a lack of, uh, for want of a better kind of word, ambition? So, the, so that's um, the retrofit accelerator homes, and we've now got 1,800 homes under, under contract for that. Um, what we're trying to do with retrofit accelerator homes is to do a sort of much deeper whole house retrofit. So it's a sort of much deeper getting closer towards net zero per each house, but it's, it's, it's a lot more expensive for each home i think the previous scheme was concentrating more on um sort of easier to treat and cheaper to treat measures such as um uh, loft insulation and cavity wall insulation so you could you know, you'll be looking at uh sp spending a few hundred pounds per property versus spending you know tens of thousands of pounds per property so i think that's the that's been the main main difference with uh, i think over the earlier part of the the decade we've treated most of the uh, e easier to treat properties and what we've got to go at now are the, the, the solid wall properties harder to treat thanks do you, do you have any kind of data that backs up you know the difference in work and money spent i'd be interested to see that i, I 
think we've probably I, I don't have it to hand I think we've answered this uh, sort of um, sort of recently so I can I can dig that out and 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 um, send send back to the committee if if you could let yeah. Um, if I could just say that the retrofit accelerator homes, um, which, as Chet says, uh, has done, you know, we've had the um, the investment in those seven homes through Energy Leap, uh, that's led on to eighteen hundred uh, homes being contracted uh, through um, th through the start of that that sort of scaling up. Uh, but the innovation partnership itself um, is hoping to take that to the next stage, um, and at that point, we are talking about. Uh, I think an estimated 100 to nearly 200,000 homes um, over the course of this decade, uh, so slightly longer period, but it is getting um, to that scale. Um, and, and the idea for that is that we would be able to demonstrate the savings that are made. Um, and, and as I mentioned, you know, 60% energy savings from the in initial projects that were done. Um, and so rather than spending money, the social housing providers spending money on regular asset management of quite old and inefficient properties, they would then see that there was a payback, if, you know, to the extent that there is, um, and invest that in the retrofit. So that's the idea of bringing the, um, the building firms and the housing providers closer together, testing this really thorough retrofit, um, and then doing it at a bigger scale. So at the moment we are in that sort of 1800 category, um, but with obviously with ambitions to scale it up because otherwise um uh, as we mentioned earlier we just wouldn't be on track for that net zero 2030 target thanks that, that does to a degree make sense but i'd love to see more information and in kind of you know and uh, if you've got a paper on that i think that'd be great if we c if you could send over but to what degree do you think that you know you talked about those those winds with the loft insulation what to what extent are you satisfied that every home is kind of sorted and you don't need to do those quick wins and uh, have a program that could large scale fix those problems I mean clearly there remains plenty to be done the London's EPC rating if you sort of look over the, um, the the full spectrum there are still far too many in the C's and worse um, you know although we have ambitions I think that um, with London councils it's EPC uh, B by the end of the decade on average for the city um, but you know w we've uh, got data that suggests that virtually all of the 750,000 social homes in London will need some form of retrofitting over the decade um, so th there is a lot to be done yeah. um, but I think there is a shift in philosophy um, certainly central government when it provides its funding out to us um, says start with the worst homes, the most inefficient ones. Start where there's vulnerability, um, but also do it in a sustainable way. So you do, so you just do the retrofit once, um, and then there are choices to be made between uh, doing more homes with a single measure or doing fewer homes really well. But you know, for the reasons that we've discussed, especially where it, if you've got tenants and you know you might be asking them to put up with disruptions several times if you if you do it retrofit of stage by stage and come back every year to annoy them um it may be better to do it in in one go and there are also you know i'm, I'm not a builder and i'd uh, uh, sort of tread cautiously here but i understand that if you do one measure if you do the loft um and you don't think about the impact that has on the rest of the house uh, it can have unintended consequences which are actually damaging so that's the reason that you have these sort of professional retrofit assessors who think about how it all fits together i think you also find as if, if if you've got the opportunity of of, of a householder saying come into my house and do some retrofit you, you want to take the opportunity to do, do as much as you can rather than having to sort of go back in the future as well uh, thank you very much we're going to move to our final section now which is retrofit housing action plan just to say to all guests that obviously we spent a lot of time talking about retrofit so please uh, don't feel the need to repeat anything it's it's all on record um i'm going to hand back to assembly member best thanks um nadia how could the mayor be doing more to increase home retrofits in London? Was that to increase home retrofits? Yeah. Um, so I think the the existing support that we've seen from the mayor in terms of the London Community Energy Fund has been very positive for community buildings and for the business sector, but it hasn't um, necessarily focused specifically on the domestic sector and tackling those buildings um, so we would like to see some um, adjustments in the criteria there I suppose for the funding um, albeit it's it's you know relatively early stage that we have started to think about this uh, for for the domestic sector so the LSEF probably haven't had a chance to 
respond to that um, inquiry yet. Um, I think the main areas that I would focus on would be really ensuring that there is that um, supply chain support, so uh, ensuring that um, the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, bus small businesses have access to um, to the tenders for the, the social housing retrofits, and also that that um, retrofit design service is enabled for the domestic sector more widely for for homeowners and landlords. Thanks, and um, Cara, never know where to look. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think it's been mentioned previously that this is going to need to get to where we need to get to. It's going to be public and private spend needed. Um, and actually, our research suggests that uh, a local approach, so street by street, house by house, can actually be the most effective. So where some people qualify, they're getting that paid for. But actually, then where people don't qualify, they can be linked up with other programs to help them or they can be advised on access to finance. Um, or use you know those efficiencies of scale so just literally moving we're going to make this street and then this street and then this street getting all the work done in the same place because you've got all the people all the infrastructure in the right places and um, skills development as people have said you know there's there's a lack of, of skills in uh, in the pipeline so that is going to be something that needs to be thought about and um, it's you know if people want stuff but there's no one to do it or the waits are too long they're going to be put off um, and then I think finan finally, there's a question on financing. Um, I know that there are green financing initiatives, of course, um, but actually what we're concerned about is that a lot of people, no matter how low interest a loan is, they're not going to be able to access finance. So our latest figures are showing that over half of adults in London have less than £300 left each month after paying for essential bills. Um, in the six months of January 2022, 41% of adults in London have experienced financial hardship. 23% had less than a thousand pounds in savings. 28% are in debt. So if you're asking people to pay for things who are technically in this able to pay sector, even with finance, they, they, it's just not going to be possible for them. So I think that's a big question mark for us is where, where do those people go and what is there in place to help and support them to make the changes that realistically we all know they're going to have to make at some point or be penalised for not making. Um, so yeah, it's it's a big question mark for us is, is where does that go when you're looking at costs of, you know, up, upwards of 10 grand, um, even at 0% interest over five years, 14 grand is £200 a month. And that's, you know, almost all of what some people would have left over. So yeah, a big question for us. And I think something to consider is you know, those alternative finance options, top up grants, credit unions, just where can people go to encourage them to bring in the private money that is needed to make this transition. Thank you. Um, and Ray, Irina, coming to you. Um, the Retrofit Housing Action Plan acknowledges London boroughs should be at the forefront of retrofit activities. But what actions do you think the GLA should take to help deliver the action plan? Well, I think, I think there are two parts to the action plan, isn't there? So there's the one um, which relates to London boroughs themselves. Um, and that is really, and, and it's coming to a question, that is really assessing what needs to be done in London boroughs. And I know we're doing that, and we're working with University College London to do that. Um, and what is coming out of that is fairly eye-watering numbers, um, both in terms of finance, but also actually what is needed to retrofit these homes. Um, so I think there's a real job of work. Um, the Mayor is supporting London boroughs, and GLA is supporting London boroughs. Um, as you know, there are seven work streams of which the um, Retrofit action, Housing Action Plan um, was one of those work streams, the results of one of those work streams. But it's actually d working, um, I think, across the boroughs, but also across the country with government, and the government has to be involved in this, to make sure that there is both the financial um, resilience, but also we talk about skills. We, we absolutely need a skilled workforce, but the amount of work that we're looking at we're looking at is just fairly unimaginable, I think. So I think, you know, absolutely trying to get the head round and, and help everybody to come develop the concept of what actually is needed if we are going to reach net zero, in our case, by 2030. Um, and the supply chains. Um, yes, actually, we absolutely need to work with supply chains. But this seems to me to be a, it's a paradigm shift, really, in what we have to be presenting. And I'm not entirely sure that we're actually thinking about that or that's actually 
it's actually feeding through into actually some of the some of the th some of the thinking about solutions. And as I say, I don't think that's particularly the mayor. Obviously, the mayor's part of it. GLA are part of it. Boroughs are part of it. But it actually it has to be a national national level as well. So I'm. I think that really. Um, obviously, there are some more local things I think that could that could um, could help. Um, and that's been mentioned, quite a few of those have been mentioned, particularly a bespoke advisory scheme. Because I think people do look at it and think, gosh, it's too complicated. Um, it has to be turned into something that I can do. And I think your point about the neighbours is a really important one, if you can see your neighbours doing that. Um, but I think there are still barriers that we need to understand. I, mean, I think we're very, very clear that one of those is the planning system. How do you look at planning in the, t in, in, in the time of net zero carbon? Um, and I think that's a job that's at London. That, that, that these are sort of things that London uh, wide are sort of grappling with. And again, I think the mayor and the GLA can, can, can help with that um, and, try and, and, and unlock it. But there are also other barriers, um, which I th uh, sorry, there are other barriers which I think we just need to try and understand um, and do that. So I think, I think looking at London as a whole, there are many things we can work with together. But actually, fundamentally, I think just helping people get their head round this idea that this is not business as usual, mm -hmm. um, and we actually have to think so much bigger um, in terms of you know skills, in terms of, 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 of supply chain, in terms of financing. Um, I'm not quite sure any of us are quite there yet. Sorry, can, can I just, I just say one, also, can I say one other thing? I think also um, finding a way of helping us make it relevant to people's lives which we absolutely know it is, is how can you get people to think that not only this is something that's, that people like me can do, but actually things like people like me actually want to do because it actually helps us in our individual lives as well as more broadly for the planet. Thanks. Just before you come in, Catherine, cause I, my next question is going to be to you and ask um, on the, those four key areas which are identified for the GLA, how can we expand our efforts um, in those areas? So perhaps if you could take that on whilst adding anything you wanted to say to Thank you. Um, I think we're probably all agreeing here about you know, the vast scale of the work that needs to be done, the fact that we're not yet geared up to do it, this, the supply chain and the skills aren't there. Um, you know, and we're all working on it, but it has to go much faster. And, and, and there's something there about belief, isn't there? And, and people thinking this isn't just a problem for this year and next year, energy prices will be better and like, we'll worry about climate change in the future. If you've got targets that are 2030, if energy prices are gonna be high for you know, at least a couple of years um, and, and may never come back to where they were or you know, you'll have sort of carbon costs in there as well, um, you, have to, you have to convince the market um, and you have to convince people who are doing training that this is something that they need to invest in. Um, one of the things that we have said to central government is that we think that all construction qualifications and apprenticeships and so forth should have mandatory retrofit training within them, um, that it shouldn't be an optional extra. Uh, but, you know, if you learn to be a builder, you learn how to, you know, to, to work on a house with it and to make it energy efficient. And that's just part of your trade. Um, so. So that's one suggestion. Um, the Mayor's Academies programmes also um, have sponsored five hubs uh, with a focus on green skills. Um, and those were formally launched in January this year. So those are now getting going. Um, so again, that's sort of helping to, uh, to support the supply chain, but it, it has been really difficult. And the turning off and on of programmes, mm -hmm. like the Green Homes Grant had a real effect. Um, you know, it, it was, noticeable that companies were willing to do a single measure they were willing to do loft insulation but if you went to them and said there are all these other whole retrofit you know i want to do my whole house um can you do these other measures as well people would just say well we haven't invested in that because it you know every every um skill that you're training your staff for takes an extra day or a week of training and we just don't we're not sure that there's going to be demand there in a year's time and i do think that's something that the mayor has a role in as well as the boroughs and you know housing associations and all the rest is just sending a, a clear constant signal that this is going to be needed um f forgive me uh I, i'm not sure the other t tell me about the other um, areas you wanted us to to talk about um, in that as well as skills uh, I got passionate about skills there. Yeah, <laughs> we did. So that's it. Um, we, I, to be honest, I think we've talked a lot about this. But if there's anything you want to speak to on coordinating efforts on infrastructure-related works, reducing planning barriers to retrofit, mm. providing guidance, and helping to fund pioneering schemes. Um, we have talked about quite a lot of that. I think. Um, 
Mr Chair, perhaps we could say something about the local energy accelerator, if that comes to infrastructure, if that, that's getting t towards the sort of things you mean, which aren't specifically about individual homes, but might be about community heating systems or um, that kind of thing. Yep, so that's, that's a scheme that we um, do at the GLA, the match fund with ERDF funding, the overall six million programme. And again, that helps provide um, support to uh, public sector organisations to develop um, clean and uh, locally generated energy uh, projects. So uh, some of the projects in scope are uh, district heating and district energy networks that, um, using renewable heat sources. Um, you know, there's some innovations in there as well, so river waste, waste heat from London underground. Um, so that, you know, that's designed to uh, speed up the pace of cutting carbon emissions. Um, sort of coming back to um, some of the stuff we're doing with London councils on on um, d doing the plan. So we're, we're working quite closely. So sort of my team's working closely with London councils and some of the uh, uh, lead boroughs, um, sitting on the steering group and sort of working with them to to uh, do shared um, sort of work plans, shared workshops for some of these things around skills, planning, procurement and, um, and private rented sectors, looking at those barriers. So over the coming sort of, uh, sort of months, we'll, we're working sort of very closely with uh, sort of our colleagues at London Councils to um, sort of build up the ideas and work plans on those. Thanks. I've, I've got a few supplementaries on energy efficiency, but if I, I'll wait until the next question because I don't want to accidentally step on toes for the answer. Very That's much okay. appreciated. I'll come back to you after this. Um, going remote to Assemblymember Cooper. Thank you. And especially considering I managed to make a mess out of the earlier questions. Um, I wondered if Catherine could tell us about the Mayor's plans for increasing knowledge and awareness of the opportunities for improving energy efficiency in people's homes. And um, it's very interesting for the questions from Assemblymember Best earlier on about what are the differences between the previous Mayor's um, very widespread energy efficiency programmes, which I myself took advantage of, and I've got 300 mil of uh, insulation in my loft, I had aerators put in my taps, I had panels put onto the back of single radiators um, that are reflector panels and also had um, brushes put onto my letterbox so that I wouldn't get a draft through the letterbox. And that was a very widespread program, but of limited measures. What are the plans now to try and get people to understand what the new set of measures are that we would need to um, be implementing to really move beyond my property is an Edwardian property and is now uh, an EPCE after those measures and it's got solar panels on it. Obviously we're talking about moving London to EPCB so I think there's a big knowledge gap there isn't there about what else we now need to do to say nothing of the financial gap of the investment that might be needed. Catherine if you could set that out a bit for us. Uh, yes, I'll certainly make a start. Um, so in January, uh, we did do some research about awareness of retrofit amongst Londoners. Um, and mm -hmm. we found that the term itself was not a very familiar one. So nearly, yeah. nearly half, about 46% of Londoners just hadn't heard the word retrofit. Um, and so there's a real risk that you know, policy wonks like me, or uh, or you know, even the mayor, if you know, if we're writing his briefing, um, go out and talk about this thing that people just don't know about. Um, so we we have to be really careful that we're communicating it um, in terms that people think about. So uh, saving energy bills, making houses more comfortable, warmer, uh, you know, and helping the planet as well. Um, so so that's a priority for us. Um, and, and we did also find, um, as as Nadia said, um, that. Londoners do see this as the right thing to do. Whether they feel they can afford to do it themselves is, I'm sure, another question at the moment. Um, but, but you know, both for the monetary savings and uh, environmental benefits as well. Um, we're looking at expanding our energy advice provision for Londoners, um, and I think that's something that we might be able to talk to you about in a future session. Um, you know, but we're really a aware of how much need there is, uh, both because of the fuel poverty angle, because of the climate and net zero requirements as well, and the fact that Londoners are not consistently aware of the options available to them. Um, and so this is something, um, well, I think I'd say, you know, to be continued, uh, but we have aspirations in this area. 
Do you think, picking up on the point, we looked at the research that showed that most people either had no idea what retrofit was or had a very vague idea. Um, do you think finding some terminology that works better? Um, full disclosure, in a previous life, I worked in this area and one piece of terminology that a lot of people found very helpful was to talk about cosy homes. Um, and it was very widespread in the Northwest. There were some... Um, housing associations and councils involved in the association of greater manchester authorities who used cozy homes as a piece of terminology do you think that would be useful to give people you know just in two words what uh, retrofit uh, doesn't give them um, i think that's a really nice idea and we're very happy to take any suggestions and you know uh very aware as a bureaucrat um, that you are you know talking to the public all the time no doubt in in better ways than we do so uh, do give us ideas thank you there were some uh, very nice graphics of houses wrapped up in scarves and hats as well to go with it. So it was very clear uh, visually what it was about, um, even for people who um, perhaps uh, weren't able to, to read the leaflets in, in detail. Moving on from that point about how do we get the message across to um, the money side of things, um, because the measures I would now need to do and lots of Londoners would need to do um, to uh, improve the energy efficiency from EPC um, C, D or E up to B um, is going to involve an awful lot of money. I think it was Rowena who just said something about eye-watering amounts of money. So I'll come to you first, Rowena. Do you think low or zero interest loans offer an opportunity to increase uptake of the kind of measures that would create um, a cosy home for me or for others? Yes, I do. I think the um, I think it have to be quite, quite low interest though because you are talking about quite large sums of money um, on, en on any kind of um, analysis. Um, I do think also it's just worth, re but, but it, ha it would have to be wrapped up in some of those other measures that we've spoken about, because I think finance is one of those issues for, um, for people, but it's actually not, not the only one. I mean, I, I, you know, we've gone through a number of iterations from national government, the Green Deal, and then the Green Homes Grant Scheme, none of which have been terribly successful, I think, partly because the level of interest rates attached to them were quite high. Plus, they were incredibly complicated if you actually wanted to um, apply for them. So there was, uh, you know, a 1.5 billion Green Homes Grant Scheme. But what impact did it actually have on energy efficiency measures across London, would you say, Rowena? I don't think I can answer that that question, I'm afraid. Catherine, I... chat, would you be able to give me a, an idea? Do you think the, the Green Homes Grant Scheme, a lot of money attached to it, but do you think it actually had much impact on energy efficiency across London? We know it was very difficult to access it in London and um, so it was very, very undercommitted in terms of the, the, the total amount of money that was um, set aside for it. So uh, I, I agree in, in, in a previous, in, in, previously in my career I was, was um, very involved in, in, in a lot of the Green Deal finance framework as well. And um, it, was, it was something might be, I, I used to work for, for British Gas and I was v v very much involved in, in, in some of the uh, sort of aspects of policy design around, around how that worked in the financing. And we just found it was just too, com the, 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 the execution was just too complex in terms of, um, sort of some of the uh, details around the accreditation, the golden rule and, and the finance was just way too expensive. Yeah, that was that was my feeling. Um, I've also worked in that sector and, you know, having nine percent, um, you know, attached to loans and things like that, I think was just too high and as well as being too complicated. I mean, a couple of people have touched on this, maybe come back to um, Cara. Um, you know, we uh, having a, a relaunch of a scheme that uh, is easy to understand with low interest rates attached to it. Do you think that would work for those people who are able to take out loans to help them in increase energy efficiency? Obviously, bearing in mind that that wouldn't be everybody. Not everyone is able to get a loan. Um, thanks. Yeah, so I think it's difficult, isn't it? Because people are kind of put between two squeezes, aren't they? Like we've got an ongoing cost of living crisis and then you've also got energy price rises. So you've got, do I try to invest now? and save money on my energy long term or do I try to save in, in other ways so I think 
these decisions are getting really hard for people. I think so. Our data shown we're looking at like over sixty percent of homes in London will cost more than fourteen thousand pounds to decarbonize. Um, so that's like install a heat pump, and that's actually only to reach EPCC. So it will be more to reach EPCB. Um, so I think the questions are the terms of of the loans and the level of interest, like the length of, by term. I mean, so is it how long is it going to be because i think unless those repayments are going to be less than your increased energy bill payments it makes it hard for you to to make that balance and to make that work um i guess it also goes back again to people understanding what the payback will be in the long term so what what am i actually do to save um eventually so people really need to understand that and yeah i mean i'd like finance definitely has a place definitely has a place but i think um the number of people for whom finance appears to be a good option is decreasing. So I guess either we need to get in quickly or we need to think about how those finance deals are working. So over what length of time and over what um, and what kind of repayment terms uh, and on percentages and things like that. So I, th I think it's a difficult balance. And of course, it has a place. Um, I just we're, we're concerned that it appears that the able to pay market at the moment, that's the only answer. and we're worried that, that people will be left out but yeah absolutely has a place and just needs to be worked out as to where it where it sits and how it can be affordable so obviously Catherine bearing in mind what um, Rowena and Cara have been saying and also what Chet um, helpfully input in terms of the complexity and also the finance was too expensive on previous iterations of Green Deal and I think Green Homes Grant as well uh, do you think this is an area that the GLA um, could help with. Is it realistic, however, for the GLA's budget to in some way cover a low or zero interest loan scheme to help improve uptake of retrofit across London? So we'll be providing advice to the mayor about what he could do with the £500 million he's looking to raise from the market, um, as well as the £90 million he's personally committed from the city hall uh, funds uh, and you know how that can contribute to net zero um, obviously there's a lot of interest in the, the retrofit uh, story at the moment um, but whether he would choose to to prioritize that for the able to pay um, I, I'm not sure because there's such uh, in, intense needs um, uh, in the sort of fuel fuel poor category um, also on the social housing side and um, kind of speaking from experience of having delivered programs before it is easier to fund larger projects when you're trying to shift hundreds of millions of pounds um you tend to look for the projects that are million pounds and up just because you know you can get the money out of the door and do something at scale um so i i you know we will have those conversations no doubt inside the gla but um i think really this is something which is so needed all across the nation it isn't a london specific problem. Um, central government has plenty of experience of trying to set up schemes, um, not always giving them as long to run as, uh, you know, as would be desirable. Um, and, and, you know, we've heard reasons why the, uh, the Green Deal finance approach didn't work. You know, it, it personally, I would say that, that feels like something that should be done at central government level, but um, always something the mayor can look at as well. Do you think that there's a deficit of ambition here um, that's emerging either locally, regionally or indeed nationally? In the past, we moved from using town gas in all of our properties across the country um, and moved to North Sea gas. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about a similar level of uh, transformation, a national infrastructure project, and we're talking about how that might be delivered in, in London. Um, are the necessary conversations taking place that are taking this properly seriously to make this happen? I think it was Rowena who was saying, you know, have people really got their heads around this? I think some of us have. But is that then being translated into something that is going to be a practical application of all of this? Are we anywhere near that point yet? Mr. Catherine. OK, um, well, the mayor has talked about a retrofit revolution, uh, so he obviously feels that something needs to, to change, not to be business as usual, um, although that 46% of Londoners who don't know what retrofit means may not have cottoned on to what the retrofit revolution is. Um, you know, I think we're all getting better at understanding the need for energy saving because 
the energy bills at the end of the month or, or you know on the prepayment side as well uh, are, are painful that awareness is rising rapidly uh, not necessarily for good reasons but it is um, I think one area where they're still in a very long way to go um, is around shifting from thinking about gas for, for boilers to thinking about heat pumps um, and, and you talked about the sh shift from town gas to North Sea gas. I mean, essentially, it's that same sort of change of it, same scale of change of infrastructure. Um, and I, I don't have confidence that London is, is ready for that right now. I know very few people who are taking up heat pumps, even in my very green and right on circle. Um, the, you know, the Department for Business has come out with these £5,000 grants through the boiler upgrade scheme. Um, but I, I, would, I don't know if they're confident about uh, the take up for that. Um, and I think we need to find ways to, to promote that, encourage it, explain it. Um, there have been quite a lot of kind of anecdotal stories about um, earlier installations of heat pumps not being satisfactory. Obviously, skills have improved over time. Um, and technology has improved over time. And I understand if you install one now, your chances are better of it working and, and pleasing you than it was 10 years ago. Um, but you know, if I think about what Element Energy told us, which is we need 2 million heat pumps installed by the end of this decade, and wonder whether we've got our minds around that, you know, like 2 million homes in London having that, that kind of change, um, even if the skills were there to do it, is the demand there that that's the next time you change your heating system you have to get away from your gas boiler and onto a heat pump basically um and and not replacing what you know with you know with like for like um and and i think there's a lot to be done in terms of political leadership um in, in terms of explaining that to londoners but there's also the practical level isn't there i mean are, are, have we actually got the information out there so that the person who's just had the heat pump fitted knows how to operate it. Have we trained the people who would come in and maintain the heat pumps? Have we even got the trained people, enough of them to install 2 million heat pumps? I mean, I've fitted some heat pumps in programmes of heat pump installation in off-gas areas outside of London. All of those things prove to be um, horrendously difficult. And also, if you haven't insulated the property properly and oversized all of the radiators and changed the side of the radiators you're probably going to be fitting a heat pump and then the house won't be warm enough and then the heat is going to go out through the walls anyway and it could be even more expensive to have people installing heat pumps are we actually even on that page yet Catherine I, I think I'll, I'll pop in and answer that um, I, yeah. I think there's pockets of that um, capacity here and there so when I um, when I used to work at British Gas, you know, we, hmm. even ten years ago, we we, we were investing in um, training centres to tr train up the next the next batch of installers, but you just never got enough demand for for all of that. Um, you know, we work with Octopus Energy for uh, for, for London Power, and mm -hmm. I, I know just in Slough they've they've just built a, a heat pump pump training centre, so they're they're training lots of new people through through that centre, training them up to in, install heat pumps and and trying to drive the market that way. So I think. Um, you know, the, the, the market, if it, if it sees that there's that long-lived demand going, going two, five, ten years, they're, they're willing to invest, but it, it, it's coming back to having that, uh, you know, long-term demand through um, uh, through support mechanisms or or, or, or that uh, long-term policy network. Yeah, and I think um, it's still quite difficult to to get there because after what happened with the feed-in tariff and all of the companies that got set up to deliver multiple solar installations on rooftops and went through all the MCS accreditation and they all then had to wind themselves down after FIT was destroyed in 2012 and, you know, whether people would feel confident to go down this route. I think you're right. It needs a big and it needs a long-term programme. But um, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, James, I think you indicated quite a while ago, but I don't know if you still want to speak. Um, it was just a point on, on the loan schemes. We talked a lot about um, the finance being the issue, but one of the uh, main issues with the Green Deal was also about what happens with the loans when people sold their homes. Things like that were never made clear, and it created a lot of uncertainty and reluctance to take um, up long-term agreements. Thank you. Assembly Member Best. Uh, thank you. Just, just coming in quickly, Catherine, uh, what are the challenges of taller buildings in terms of energy efficiency, both new buildings and existing buildings? 
I'm afraid I'm looking blank here. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not enough of an expert to, to answer that, I'm afraid. I, th I think for retrofit, there's, you know, th you know th there are the challenges of, um, you know, sort of additional costs in, in terms of s scaffolding. So that's the, that. I'm, I'm not thinking about um, sort of high rise. I'm, I'm thinking about sort of um, sort of more the three or four kind of story buildings that we get across London for you know for uh, you know for, for for the kind of you know big tower blocks. I'm 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 not, I'm not close enough to it, but to to, to answer really. Could I um, just add to that? So I think from what we've seen in terms of um, flats and apartment blocks is that they need to be approached all together rather than one flat at a time. Um, reason being you get a lot of thermal bridging happening across different flats and different parts of the apartment blocks. Um, it can be hard to do that obviously because all the tenants are different, they want different things, doing it at different times and um, yeah I think the, the challenge is here in t is in terms of doing the whole building in one go. Thanks. Um, and perhaps if I could ask you, Nadia, and then come to the GLA team as well. Uh, do you share the concerns previously heard at the Planning and Regeneration Committee that from six storeys to 20 storeys, energy intensity per square metre is doubled? Um, we definitely, yeah, share that concern. Um, we would be interested to find out more about why the energy intensity is doubled. Um, we, um, I, I would assume it is very much down to the um, it's kind of uh, natural uh, habitat of the properties at the top being a lot colder in the winter and a lot hotter in the summer. Um, and that's that would be the cause, but I would be interested to find out more on that. I'm, I'm just not familiar with that report. I, I don't think we are familiar with that report, so I can... Uh, look into it, Peter. Um, well, how about the, the 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 fact then that how how uh, you don't have to know the report; it's just a fact. So, how would you uh, feel about the fact that the energy intensity from six stories to twenty stories doubles per square meter? So, I, th I think one of the things that we're doing at the moment in the GLA is um, is kind of segmenting the both the residential and uh, non-domestic markets better. To just say we've got a better analysis ourselves of the scale of the problem and where interventions will make the biggest difference. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's an interesting piece of data for us to take in to to think about what what it would mean for our programs and our policies. Um, but I, you know, we're kind of trying to make those. Um, come, come to those conclusions across, uh, I think it's you know, 75% uh, houses, 25% flats that we're dealing with uh, on the domestic side uh, and, and thinking what that means about the levers that we have and how we can use them. So, uh, you know, happy to take that away, think about it, come back with further ideas. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks. I, I mean, I struggle with the concept I'd be introducing data like that. I think that's a that would be a pretty known fact and something that perhaps as a GLA team th that you should be considering, and especially when we look forward to the London plan and, and new developments and not building ourselves problems for the future and the problems that high rises uh, have. And so I think it would be incumbent perhaps on you and the team to have some advice to the mayor on that. More, sorry, more of, that was more of a comment than a question, but of course you were. Thank you, Assembly Member Best. Uh, Rowena, uh, you wanted to come in there? Just very quickly, I think James was suggesting maybe wa water pumping, if you're trying to um, get water up to higher buildings, that's one cost. I think I just wanted to make the point that I think there's a lot of nervousness around um, retrofitting, uh, particularly tall tower blocks at the moment, because of the cladding issues. So that's the most effective way of doing it. But obviously with Grenfell and, um, and, and fire, fire risk, I think there's quite a lot of nervousness, even if it was clear enough what standards are. Thank you. I know we've got somebody around the clock here too who chairs the Fire Resilience and Emergency Planning Committee, so maybe that's something we can we can look into there as well. Thank you. Um, I've just got a final few questions just to finish off the meeting, so I'm going to turn to Cara. Um, Cara, Citizens Advice has been calling for a government-backed guarantee scheme to give people confidence to undertake retrofit works. Is there any indication the government's planning to take up this recommendation? Um, short answer, no. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, we've, we've been calling for it I mean, and we will continue to do so. I think the awareness that advice is needed is obviously increasing, but short term, we haven't seen that um, that commitment yet. Um, 
but yeah I, I think realistically it there's only one way this is going to go if we're going to get to the 600 um thousand heat pumps if we're going to get to epcc if we're going to get to net zero 2050 people will need advice because they're going to have to pay for this work um so yeah short term and not not that i'm aware of but long term i am yeah confident that something will have to come in and fill that gap i'm glad you're feeling optimistic on that it's giving me some hope um Catherine earlier in this meeting said that we have to convince the market. Is there anything the mayor or local government could be doing to encourage confidence for the individual consumer? Um, I mean, I think we've talked a lot about information, about advice. I think um, one thing that maybe is missing is those good news stories. I think just, you know, we've all sort of seen there's been a slight increase in, in negative press around heat pumps, around net zero. And I think that all just puts into people's minds that worry that is this the really the right thing that I want to do? I think a lot of people have heard stories about how they don't want to have a heat pump because they're going to be cold. Um, so understanding what the benefits are as well, I think is really important. And I think some of the measures that we've we've discussed on their own don't bring really any benefits. Um, if I put in a heat pump into my house, Today, I would be colder and I'd be spending a lot more money. Um, but that's because a heat pump is not the right thing for me to put into my house right now. Uh, so I think it's getting the measures right, getting them in the right order and just putting out a bit more of that kind of good news that this can work and it can bring benefits for people. So yeah, I think any kind of advice offer also needs to be sort of coupled with a um, an understanding of where those benefits will come from for each consumer in, in their individual circumstances. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, and Nadia, if I can turn to you speaking individually now and not necessarily as chair, so changing hats, I'd really like to see a government backed guarantee scheme. I think that's clearly needed here. Um, if that doesn't happen, though, what again, what do you think the mayor or the local government could do to increase confidence? So I think um, the figures that Catherine mentioned earlier about awareness of retrofit are really, really crucial for us to think about. Lots of people don't even know what retrofit is right now. Um, and just touching on sort of what we what we had mentioned about raising awareness about it and you know financing solutions and enabling people, I think we really need to think about retrofit in the context of general building works. How many people over lockdown had a loft conversion? How many people had an extension? How many people put in a new kitchen? It's all of these are trigger points for retrofit. So if we're not training our builders to say, oh, if you're having an extension, why don't you put underfloor insulation in the old part of your house? If you're having a loft conversion, why don't you put um, external wall insulation on this part of your house, um, then I think we're, we're missing a point there. Um, so yeah, I think we, we really need to integrate retrofit into existing uh, building, um, you know, th how we communicate building works uh, a bit more. Um, and just increase awareness through that avenue, I would say, is, is the main thing. I think it's it's a very chicken and egg situation with the supply chain. Um, I think grant schemes like the boiler upgrade scheme are, are, are brilliant mainly because they raise awareness about retrofit, not necessarily because they offer the right solutions technically. Heat pumps won't work for most of the homes that we're seeing in, in London that we're working with because the homes are too old and too energy inefficient. They'll have to do a lot of insulating before they can put in a heat pump to make it financially sensible. But the number of people that um, came to our advice service after they'd heard about the Green Homes Grant was absolutely overwhelming. And, you know, that's how they found out about retrofit. That's how they found out about, you know, deciding to do something green with their home. So I think that's uh, another important thing to think about as well. Um, there was a previous committee report of this um, committee actually that looked at both insulating and ventilating. Um, how much, so of course there's a barrier to people even knowing about retrofitting and insulation. How, uh, where do you think people are of a ventilation issue as well, just in your experience? People don't really know. <laughs> to be honest, retrofit is a very, very complex issue. It's, it's, uh, it, I've been working on retrofit for the past two years very intensively and I don't know half the things I should know about insulating and ventilating a property 
it is something you do need a qualification in retrofit coordination to be able to deal with because our buildings were built for a completely different heating system, for a completely different um, style of life um, to what we use them for now. So uh, making sure that it's all integrated, I think, should come down to someone who's qualified and someone who's experienced, not the average homeowner, to understand all of this. Thank you. If this has only been half your knowledge, that's quite scary because you've been a very informed guest. <laughs> um, and finally, if I can turn to Catherine. Um, the Tony Blair Institute recently published a report which proposed the creation of a one-stop shop home energy service combining vice grants and interest-free loans to deliver a simple consumer offer. Um, has the GLA read the report and its findings? And if so, has it considered adopting this recommendation? Um, yes, yeah, so we are aware of the report. Um, it's actually one of a few different papers um, that have been released over the past couple of months. Um, I think there was another one by Beringa, another one by E3G on retrofit. Um, and those reports have a number of features in common, um, including the government setting a clear vision uh, to motivate consumers for industry to act and invest um, and so forth. So we're, we are analysing a number of different reports that have come out. Um, I think we're broadly aligned with all of those elements. Um, so we're, we're working through the detail and as we think about how we scale up our work on retrofit and energy advisory services uh, to accelerate action in London, um, we will be taking that into account. Thank you very much. And I've got Cara is indicating, I believe. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, just on the um, ventilation and insulation point, I think I would just echo uh, very much what Nadia said. People just don't don't know. I think um, also the current frameworks don't necessarily make that distinction that clear or obvious for people. Um, like an EPC uh, certificate is just going to say these are the things that one could do to improve the energy efficiency. And actually some of them, if you did do them, would decrease the energy efficiency of your home, potentially make the indoor environment quite unpleasant and, and detrimental to your health as well. So I think that's where it's really, really important that it's a holistic whole home assessment and not just a random list of measures that could work. Um, you know, we've, we've seen instances of people coming to us where they've put on external wall insulation and their home is damp or they've put on external wall insulation and now they're trying to sell their house. Turns out they can't get a mortgage because it hasn't been done right or because no one knows what's underneath it. You know, all of these things like the consumers really need to have confidence that what is being put on is being put on right. It needs to be put on in the right order and it needs to be done in a way that's appropriate and is not going to decrease the um, the enjoyment of being inside your house. You know, no one wants to have a highly insulated but toxic home. And I think that's something that we also need to consider is um, it's not just about tightening up buildings. It's also about letting air um, and toxins kind of escape in, in an appropriate and controlled way. Thank you very much. And Rowena. It's a bit of a follow up from the, um, from the, from the guarantee. And I, I agree, I think that would be really helpful but um short of that or even as well as that i think having something that people feel um almost they're guaranteed to have competent workers so, so have, having i think that's really important to make sure that people know where they can go they can go to one place and um be confident in the people that, you know, so so you, you know, solar together for example if you go to solar together and i think there are quite a few problems about solar together in terms of getting take up um but actually if you go there you're reasonably confident that the person who's providing the solar together um, is someone who's skilled to do that job. And I think finding a way of having a, I don't know, having a register or, a, um, or sort of in something which says if you go, go to this place, there you can, you can find a contractor that can do this work. I think the other point I'd like to make is absolutely you need people to come in who can do the work, but you also need, to, you need a trade that understands if you, if you come in later and you do a bit of um, um, some, some kind of a work on the house, you're not going to mess up the internal insulation, for example, by drilling a whacking great hole through it. So it's, there's, a real, there's, there's a real cultural shift, I think, in actually what homes are and, and how, how they need to be managed and built. That seems like a good place to end on a big cultural shift so we can get homes retrofitted. Thank you very much to all the guests in the chamber and indeed to Cara uh, remotely. Thank you for joining us too. And um, we've reached the end of a question and answer session. We've still got a few items of business to deal with, so please feel free to leave or you're welcome to stay for the excitement. Um, can I ask the committee to note the report and the discussion? Thank you. And can we also delegate authority to me as chair in consultation with party group lead members to agree any output arising from a discussion? Thank you. Can I ask the committee to note its work programme? 
Excellent. The next meeting of the Environment Committee is scheduled for 19th of July 2022, 10am in the Chamber City Hall. I have no urgent business, which concludes today's meeting. Thank you.